Volume Two, Chapter Thirteen of Emma by Jane Austen, read for LibriVox.org into the public domain. Emma continued to entertain no doubt of her being in love. Her ideas only varied as to the how much. At first, she thought it was a good deal, and afterwards, but little. She had great pleasure in hearing Frank Churchill talked of, and for his sake, greater pleasure than ever in seeing Mr. and Mrs. Weston. She was very often thinking of him, and quite impatient for a letter, that she might know how he was, how were his spirits, how was his aunt, and what was the chance of his coming to Randall's again this spring. But on the other hand, she could not admit herself to be unhappy, nor, after the first morning, to be less disposed for employment than usual. She was still busy and cheerful, and pleasing as he was, she could yet imagine him to have faults, and farther, though thinking of him so much, and as she sat down drawing or working, forming a thousand amusing schemes for the progress and close of their attachment, fancying interesting dialogues, and inventing elegant letters, the conclusion of every imaginary declaration on his side was that she refused him. Their affection was always to subside into friendship. Everything tender and charming was to mark their parting, but still they were to part. When she became sensible of this, it struck her that she could not be very much in love, for in spite of her previous and fixed determination never to quit her father, never to marry, a strong attachment certainly must produce more of a struggle than she could foresee in her own feelings. "'I do not find myself making any use of the word sacrifice,' said she. "'In not one of all my clever replies, my delicate negatives, is there any allusion to making a sacrifice. I do suspect that he is not really necessary to my happiness.' so much the better. I certainly will not persuade myself to feel more than I do. I am quite enough in love. I should be sorry to be more. Upon the whole, she was equally contented with her view of his feelings. He is undoubtedly very much in love. Everything denotes it. Very much in love indeed. And when he comes again, if his affection continue, I must be on my guard not to encourage it. It would be most inexcusable to do otherwise, as my own mind is quite made up. Not that I imagine he can think I have been encouraging him hitherto. No, if he had believed me at all to share his feelings, he would not have been so wretched. Could he have thought himself encouraged, his looks and language at parting would have been different. Still, however, I must be on my guard. This is in the supposition of his attachment continuing what it is now, but I do not know that I expect it will. I do not look upon him to be quite the sort of man. I do not altogether build upon his steadiness or constancy. His feelings are warm, but I can imagine them rather changeable. Every consideration of the subject, in short, makes me thankful that my happiness is not more deeply involved. I shall do very well again after a little while, and then it will be a good thing over, for they say everybody is in love once in their lives, and I shall have been let off easily. When his letter to Mrs. Weston arrived, Emma had the perusal of it, and she read it with a degree of pleasure and admiration which made her at first shake her head over her own sensations, and think she had undervalued their strength. It was a long, well-written letter, giving the particulars of his journey and of his feelings, expressing all the affection, gratitude, and respect which was natural and honourable, and describing everything exterior and local that could be supposed attractive, with spirit and precision. No suspicious flourishes, now, of apology or concern. It was the language of real feeling toward Mrs. Weston, and the transition from Highbury to Enscombe, the contrast between the places in some of the first blessings of social life, was just enough touched on to show how keenly it was felt, and how much more might have been said but for the restraints of propriety. The charm of her own name was not wanting. Miss Woodhouse appeared more than once, and never without a something of pleasing connection, either a compliment to her taste, or a remembrance of what she had said, and in the very last time of its meeting her eye, unadorned as it was by any such broad wreath of gallantry, she could yet discern the effect of her influence, and acknowledge the greatest compliment, perhaps, of all conveyed. Compressed into the very lowest vacant corner were these words, I had not a spare moment on Tuesday, as you know, for Miss Woodhouse's beautiful little friend. Pray make my excuses and adieus to her. This, Emma could not doubt, was all for herself. Harriet was remembered only from being her friend. His information and prospects as to Enscombe were neither worse nor better than had yet been anticipated. Mrs. Churchill was recovering, and he dared not yet, even in his own imagination, fix a time for coming to Randall's again. Gratifying, however, and stimulative as the letter was in the material part, its sentiments, she yet found, when it was folded up and returned to Mrs. Weston, 
that it had not added any lasting warmth, that she could still do without the writer, and that he must learn to do without her. Her intentions were unchanged. Her resolution of refusing only grew more interesting by the addition of a scheme for his subsequent consolation and happiness. His recollection of Harriet, and the words which clothed it, the beautiful little friend, suggested to her the idea of Harriet succeeding her in his affections. Was it impossible? No. Harriet, undoubtedly, was greatly his inferior in understanding, but he had been very much struck with the loveliness of her face, and the warm simplicity of her manner, and all the probabilities of circumstance and connection were in her favour. For Harriet it would be advantageous and delightful indeed. I must not dwell upon it, said she. I must not think of it. I know the danger of indulging such speculations. But stranger things have happened, and when we cease to care for each other as we do now, it will be the means of confirming us in that sort of true disinterested friendship which I can already look forward to with pleasure. It was as well to have a comfort in store on Harriet's behalf, though it might be wise to let the fancy touch it seldom, for evil in that quarter was at hand. As Frank Churchill's arrival had succeeded Mr. Elton's engagement in the conversation of Highbury, as the latest interest had entirely borne down the first, so now, upon Frank Churchill's disappearance, Mr. Elton's concerns were assuming the most irresistible form. His wedding day was named. He would soon be among them again, Mr. Elton and his bride. There was hardly time to talk over the first letter from Enscombe, before Mr. Elton and his bride was in everybody's mouth, and Frank Churchill was forgotten. Emma grew sick at the sound. She had had three weeks of happy exemption from Mr. Elton, and Harriet's mind, she had been willing to hope, had been lately gaining strength. With Mr. Weston's ball in view, at least, there had been a great deal of insensibility to other things, but it was now too evident that she had not attained such a state of composure as could stand against the actual approach, new carriage, bell-ringing, and all. Poor Harriet was in a flutter of spirits which required all the reasonings and soothings and attentions of every kind that Emma could give. Emma felt that she could not do too much for her, that Harriet had a right to all her ingenuity and all her patience, but it was heavy work to be for ever convincing without producing any effect, for ever agreed to without being able to make their opinions the same. Harriet listened submissively, and said, it was very true, it was just as Miss Woodhouse described, it was not worth while to think about them, she would not think about them any longer. But no change of subject could avail, and the next half-hour saw her as anxious and restless about the Eltons as before. At last Emma attacked her on another ground. "'Your allowing yourself to be so occupied and so unhappy about Mr. Elton's marrying, Harriet, is the strongest reproach you can make me. You could not give me a greater reproof for the mistake I fell into. It was all my doing, I know. I have not forgotten it, I assure you.' Deceived myself, I did very miserably deceive you, and it will be a painful reflection to me for ever. Do not imagine me in danger of forgetting it. Harriet felt this too much to utter more than a few words of eager exclamation. Emma continued, I have not said, exert yourself, Harriet, for my sake. Think less, talk less of Mr. Elton for my sake. Because, for your own sake, rather, I would wish it to be done. For the sake of what is more important than my comfort, a habit of self-command in you— a consideration of what is your duty, an attention to propriety, an endeavour to avoid the suspicions of others, to save your health and credit, and restore your tranquillity. These are the motives which I have been pressing on you. They are very important, and sorry I am that you cannot feel them sufficiently to act upon them. My being saved from pain is a very secondary consideration. I want you to save yourself from greater pain. Perhaps I may sometimes have felt that Harriet would not forget what was due, or rather, what would be kind by me. This appeal to her affections did more than all the rest. The idea of wanting gratitude and consideration for Miss Woodhouse, whom she really loved extremely, made her wretched for a while, and when the violence of grief was comforted away, still remained powerful enough to prompt what was right and support her in it very tolerably. You, who have been the best friend I ever had in my life, want gratitude to you. Nobody is equal to you. I care for nobody as I do for you. Oh, Miss Woodhouse, how ungrateful I have been! Such expressions, assisted as they were by everything that look and manner could do, made Emma feel that she had never loved Harriet so well, nor valued her affection so highly before. There is no charm equal to tenderness of heart, said she afterwards to herself. There is nothing to be compared to it. Warmth and tenderness of heart, with an affectionate open manner, will beat all the clearness of head in the world, for attraction, I'm sure it will. It is tenderness of heart which makes my dear father so generally beloved, 
which gives Isabella all her popularity. I have it not, but I know how to prize and respect it. Harriet is my superior in all the charms and all the felicity it gives. Dear Harriet, I would not change you for the clearest-headed, longest-sighted, best-judging female breathing. Oh, the coldness of a Jane Fairfax! Harriet is worth a hundred such, and for a wife, a sensible man's wife, it is invaluable. I mention no names, but happy the man who changes Emma for Harriet. End of Volume 2, Chapter 13 Read by Sibella Denton for more information, please visit LibriVox.org. Volume 2, Chapter 14 of Emma by Jane Austen. Read for LibriVox.org into the public domain. Mrs. Elton was first seen at church, but though devotion might be interrupted, curiosity could not be satisfied by a bride in a pew and it must be left for the visits in form which were then to be paid, to settle whether she were very pretty indeed, or only rather pretty, or not pretty at all. Emma had feelings, less of curiosity than of pride or propriety, to make her resolve on not being the last to pay her respects, and she made a point of Harriet's going with her, that the worst of the business might be gone through as soon as possible. She could not enter the house again, could not be in the same room to which she had with such vain artifice retreated three months ago, to lace up her boot, without recollecting. A thousand vexatious thoughts would occur. Compliments, charades, and horrible blunders, and it was not to be supposed that poor Harriet should not be recollecting too, but she behaved very well, and was only rather pale and silent. The visit was, of course, short, and there was so much embarrassment and occupation of mind to shorten it, that Emma would not allow herself entirely to form an opinion of the lady, and on no account to give one, beyond the nothing meaning terms of being elegantly dressed and very pleasing. She did not really like her. She would not be in a hurry to find fault, but she suspected that there was no elegance, ease, but not elegance. She was almost sure that for a young woman, a stranger, a bride, there was too much ease. Her person was rather good, her face not unpretty, but neither feature, nor air, nor voice, nor manner were elegant. Emma thought at least it would turn out so. As for Mr. Elton, his manners did not appear. But no, she would not permit a hasty or witty word from herself about his manners. It was an awkward ceremony at any time to be receiving wedding visits, and a man had need to be all grace to acquit himself well through it. The woman was better off, she might have the assistance of fine clothes, and the privilege of bashfulness, but the man had only his own good sense to depend on, and when she considered how peculiarly unlucky poor Mr. Elton was in being in the same room at once, with the woman he had just married, the woman he had wanted to marry, and the woman whom he had been expected to marry, she must allow him to have the right to look as little wise, and to be as much affectedly, and as little really easy as could be. "'Well, Miss Woodhouse,' said Harriet, when they had quitted the house, and after waiting in vain for her friend to begin, "'Well, Miss Woodhouse,' with a gentle sigh, "'what do you think of her? Is she not very charming?' There was a little hesitation in Emma's answer. "'Oh, yes, very, a very pleasing young woman. I think her beautiful, quite beautiful. Very nicely dressed, indeed, a remarkably elegant gown. I am not at all surprised that he should have fallen in love.' Oh, no, there is nothing to surprise one at all. A pretty fortune, and she came in his way. I dare say, returned Harriet, sighing again, I dare say she was very much attracted to him. Perhaps she might, but it is not every man's fate to marry the woman who loves him best. Miss Hawkins perhaps wanted a home, and thought this the best offer she was likely to have. Yes, said Harriet earnestly, and well she might. Nobody could ever have a better. Well, I wish them happy with all my heart. And now, Miss Woodhouse, I do not think I shall mind seeing them again. He is just as superior as ever, but being married, you know, is quite a different thing. No, indeed, Miss Woodhouse, you need not be afraid. I can sit and admire him now without any great misery. To know that he has not thrown himself away is such a comfort. She does seem a charming young woman, just what he deserves. Happy creature! He called her Augusta. How delightful! When the visit was returned, Emma made up her mind. She could then see more and judge better. From Harriet's happening not to be at Hartfield, and her father's being present to engage Mr. Elton, she had a quarter of an hour of the lady's conversation to herself, and could composedly attend to her, and the quarter of an hour quite convinced her that Mrs. Elton was a vain woman, extremely well satisfied with herself, and thinking much of her own importance. 
that she meant to shine and be very superior, but with manners which had been formed in a bad school, pert and familiar, that all her notions were drawn from one set of people, and one style of living, that if not foolish she was ignorant, and that her society would certainly do Mr. Elton no good. Harriet would have been a better match. If not wise or refined herself, she would have connected him with those who were, but Miss Hawkins, it might be fairly supposed, from her easy conceit, had been the best of her own set. The rich brother-in-law near Bristol was the pride of the alliance, and his place and his carriages were the pride of him. The very first subject after being seated was Maple Grove, my brother, Mr. Suckling's seat, a comparison of Hartfield to Maple Grove. The grounds of Hartfield were small, but neat and pretty, and the house was modern and well built. Mrs. Elton seemed most favourably impressed by the size of the room, the entrance, and all that she could see or imagine. Very like Maple Grove, indeed. She was quite struck by the likeness. That room was the very shape and size of the morning-room at Maple Grove, her sister's favourite room. Mr. Elton was appealed to. Was it not astonishingly like? She could really almost fancy herself at Maple Grove. And the staircase! You know, as I came in, I observed how very like the staircase was, placed in exactly the same part of the house. I really could not help exclaiming. I assure you, Miss Woodhouse, it is very delightful to me, to be reminded of a place I am so extremely partial to as Maple Grove. I have spent so many happy months there, with a little sigh of sentiment. A charming place, undoubtedly. Everybody who sees it is struck by its beauty, but to me it has been quite a home." Whenever you are transplanted, like me, Miss Woodhouse, you will understand how very delightful it is to meet with anything at all like what one has left behind. I always say this is quite one of the evils of matrimony. Emma made as slight a reply as she could, but it was fully sufficient for Mrs. Elton, who only wanted to be talking herself. So extremely like Maple Grove! And it is not merely the house. The grounds, I assure you, as far as I could observe, are strikingly like— the laurels at Maple Grove are in the same profusion as here, and stand very much in the same way, just across the lawn, and I had a glimpse of a fine large tree, with a bench round it, which put me so exactly in mind. My brother and sister will be enchanted with this place. People who have extensive grounds themselves are always pleased with anything in the same style. Emma doubted the truth of this sentiment. She had a great idea that people who had extensive grounds themselves cared very little for the extensive grounds of anybody else, but it was not worth while to attack an error so double-dyed, and therefore only said in reply, "'When you have seen more of the country, I am afraid you will think you have overrated Hartfield. Surrey is full of beauties.' "'Oh, yes, I am quite aware of that. It is the Garden of England, you know. Surrey is the Garden of England.' "'Yes, but we must not rest our claims on that distinction. Many counties, I believe, are called the Garden of England, as well as Surrey.' "'No, I fancy not,' replied Mrs. Elton, with a most satisfied smile. "'I never heard any county but Surrey called so.' Emma was silenced. "'My brother and sister have promised us a visit in the spring, or summer, at farthest,' continued Mrs. Elton, "'and that will be our time for exploring. While they are with us, we shall explore a great deal, I say.' They will have their barouche landau, of course, which holds four perfectly, and therefore, without saying anything of our carriage, we should be able to explore the different beauties extremely well. They would hardly come in their chaise, I think, at that season of the year. Indeed, when the time draws on, I shall decidedly recommend their bringing the barouche landau. It will be so very much preferable. When people come into a beautiful country of this sort, you know, Miss Woodhouse, one naturally wishes them to see as much as possible— and Mr. Suckling is extremely fond of exploring. We explored to King's Weston twice last summer, in that way, most delightfully, just after their first having the Barouche Landau. You have many parties of that kind here, I suppose, Miss Woodhouse, every summer. No, not immediately here. We are rather out of distance of the very striking beauties which attract the sort of parties you speak of, and we are a very quiet set of people, I believe, more disposed to stay at home than engage in schemes of pleasure." Ah, there is nothing like staying at home for real comfort. Nobody can be more devoted to home than I am. I was quite a proverb for it at Maple Grove. Many a time has Selina said, when she has been going to Bristol, I really cannot get this girl to move from the house. I absolutely must go in myself, though I hate being stuck up in the Bruce Landau without a companion, but Augusta, I believe, with her own good will, would never stir beyond the park paling.' 
Many a time she has said so, and yet I am no advocate for entire seclusion. I think, on the contrary, when people shut themselves up entirely from society, it is a very bad thing, and that it is much more advisable to mix in the world in a proper degree, without living in it either too much or too little. I perfectly understand your situation, however, Miss Woodhouse, looking towards Mr. Woodhouse. Your father's state of health must be a great drawback. Why does he not try Bath? Indeed, he should. Let me recommend Bath to you. I assure you, I have no doubt if it's doing Mr. Woodhouse good. My father tried it more than once formerly, but without receiving any benefit, and Mr. Perry, whose name, I dare say, is not unknown to you, does not conceive it would be at all more likely to be useful now. Ah, that's a great pity, for I assure you, Miss Woodhouse, where the waters do agree, it is quite wonderful the relief they give. In my bath life I have seen such instances of it, and it is so cheerful a place that it could not fail of being used to Mr. Woodhouse's spirits, which I understand are sometimes much depressed. And as to its recommendations to you, I fancy I need not take much pains to dwell upon them. The advantages of bath to the young are pretty generally understood. It would be a charming introduction for you, who have lived so secluded a life, and I could immediately secure you some of the best society in the place— a line from me would bring you a little host of acquaintance, and my particular friend, Mrs. Partridge, the lady I have always resided with when in Bath, would be most happy to show you any attentions, and would be the very person for you to go into public with. This was as much as Emma could bear without being impolite. The idea of her being indebted to Mrs. Elton for what was called an introduction, of her going into public under the auspices of a friend of Mrs. Elton's, probably some vulgar, dashing widow, who, with the help of a boarder, just made shift to live. The dignity of Miss Woodhouse of Hartfield was sunk indeed. She restrained herself, however, from any reproofs she could have given, and only thanked Mrs. Elton coolly, but their going to Bath was quite out of the question, and she was not perfectly convinced that the place might suit her better than her father and then, to prevent further outrage and indignation, changed the subject directly. I do not ask whether you are musical, Mrs. Elton. Upon these occasions a lady's character generally precedes her, and Tybury has long known that you are a superior performer. Oh, no, indeed, I must protest against any such idea. A superior performer? Very far from it, I assure you. Consider from how partial a quarter your information came. I am dotingly fond of music, passionately fond, and my friends say I am not entirely devoid of taste. But as to anything else, upon my honour, my performance is mediocre to the last degree. You, Miss Woodhouse, I well know, play delightfully. I assure you, it has been the greatest satisfaction, comfort, and delight to me, to hear what a musical society I am got into. I absolutely cannot do without music. It is a necessary of life to me, and, having always been used to a very musical society, both at Maple Grove and in Bath, it would have been a most serious sacrifice. I honestly said as much to Mr. E. when he was speaking of my future home, and expressing his fears lest the retirement of it should be disagreeable, and the inferiority of the house, too, knowing what I had been accustomed to, of course he was not wholly without apprehension. When he was speaking of it in that way, I honestly said that the world I could give up, parties, balls, plays, for I had no fear of retirement. Blessed with so many resources within myself, the world was not necessary to me. I could do very well without it. To those who had no resources it was a different thing, but my resources made me quite independent. And as to smaller-sized rooms than I had been used to, I really could not give it a thought. I hoped I was perfectly equal to any sacrifice of that description— Certainly I had been accustomed to every luxury at Maple Grove, but I did assure him that two carriages were not necessary to my happiness, nor were spacious apartments. But, said I, to be quite honest, I do not think I can live without something of a musical society. I condition for nothing else, but without music life would be a blank to me. We cannot suppose, said Emma, smiling, that Mr. Elton would hesitate to assure you of there being a very musical society in Highbury, and I hope you will not find he has outstepped the truth more than may be pardoned, in consideration of the motive. No, indeed, I have no doubts at all on that head. I am delighted to find myself in such a circle. I hope we shall have many sweet little concerts together. I think, Miss Woodhouse, you and I must establish a musical club, and have regular weekly meetings at your house or ours. Will it not be a good plan? If we exert ourselves, I think we shall not be long in want of allies.' 
something of that nature would be particularly desirable for me as an inducement to keep me in practice for married women you know there is a sad story against them in general they are but too apt to give up music but you who are so extremely fond of it there can be no danger surely i should hope not but really when i look round among my acquaintance i tremble selina has entirely given up music never touches the instrument though she played sweetly and the same may be said of mrs jeffreys clara partridge that was and of the two millmans now mrs bird and mrs james cooper and of more than i can enumerate upon my word it is enough to put one in a fright I used to be quite angry with Selina, but really I now begin to comprehend that a married woman has many things to call her attention. I believe I was half an hour this morning shut up with my housekeeper. "'But everything of that kind,' said Emma, "'will soon be in so regular a train. Well,' said Mrs. Elton, laughing, "'we shall see.' Emma, finding her so determined upon neglecting her music, had nothing more to say, and after a moment's pause Mrs. Elton chose another subject. "'We have been calling at Randall's,' said she, "'and found them both at home, "'and very pleasant people they seem to be. "'I like them extremely. "'Mr. Weston seems an excellent creature, "'quite a first-rate favourite with me already, I assure you. "'And she appears so truly good, "'there is something so motherly and kind-hearted about her, "'that it wins upon one directly. "'She was your governess, I think.' "'Emma was almost too much astonished to answer, "'but Mrs. Elton hardly waited for the affirmative "'before she went on.' Having understood as much, I was rather astonished to find her so very ladylike. But she is really quite the gentlewoman. Mrs. Weston's manners, said Emma, were always particularly good. Their propriety, simplicity, and elegance would make them the safest model for any young woman. And who do you think came in while we were there? Emma was quite at a loss. The tone implied some old acquaintance. And how could she possibly guess? Knightley, continued Mr. Elton, Knightley himself— was not it lucky for being within when he called the other day i had never seen him before and of course so particular a friend of mr e s i had a great curiosity my friend knightley had been so often mentioned that i was really impatient to see him and i must do my caro sposo the justice to say that he need not be ashamed of his friend knightley is quite the gentleman i like him very much decidedly i think a very gentlemanlike man happily it was now time to be gone they were off, and Emma could breathe. "'Insufferable woman!' was her immediate exclamation. "'Worse than I had supposed. Absolutely insufferable. Knightley! I could not have believed it. Knightley! Never seen him in her life before, and call him Knightley, and discover that he is a gentleman. A little upstart, vulgar being, with her Mr. E. and her caro sposo and her resources, and all her airs of pert pretension and underbred finery. Actually to discover that Mr. Knightley is a gentleman— I doubt whether he will return the compliment and discover her to be a lady. I could not have believed it. And to propose that she and I should unite to form a musical club, one would fancy we were bosom friends, and Mrs. Weston, astonished that the person who had brought me up should be a gentlewoman. Worse and worse. I never met with her equal, much beyond my hopes. Harriet is disgraced by any comparison. Oh, what would Frank Churchill say to her if he were here? How angry and how diverted he would be! Ah, there I am, thinking of him directly, always the first person to be thought of. How I catch myself out! Frank Churchill comes as regularly into my mind. All this ran so glibly through her thoughts, that by the time her father had arranged himself, after the bustle of the Elton's departure, and was ready to speak, she was very tolerably capable of attending. "'Well, my dear,' he deliberately began, "'considering we never saw her before, "'she seems a very pretty sort of young lady, "'and I dare say that she was very much pleased with you. "'She speaks a little too quick. "'A little quickness of voice there is which rather hurts the ear. "'But I believe I am nice, I do not like strange voices, "'and nobody speaks like you and poor Miss Taylor. "'However, she seems a very obliging, pretty-behaved young lady, "'and no doubt will make him a very good wife, though i think he had better not have been married i made the best excuses i could for not having been able to wait on him and mrs elton on this happy occasion i said that i hoped i should in the course of the summer but i ought to have gone before not to wait upon a bride is very remiss ah it shows what a sad invalid i am but i do not like the corner into vicarage lane i dare say your apologies were accepted sir mr elton knows you 
"'Yes, but a young lady, a bride. I ought to have paid my respects to her, if possible. It was being very deficient. But, my dear papa, you are no friend to matrimony, and therefore why should you be so anxious to pay your respects to a bride? It ought to be no recommendation to you. It is encouraging people to marry, if you make so much of them.' "'No, my dear, I never encouraged anybody to marry, but I would always wish to pay every proper attention to a lady, and a bride especially is never to be neglected. More is avowedly due to her. A bride, you know, my dear, is always the first in company. Let the others be who they may.' "'Well, papa, if this is not encouragement to marry, I do not know what is. And I should never have expected you to be lending your sanction to such vanity-baits for poor young ladies.' "'My dear, you do not understand me. This is a matter of mere common politeness and good breeding, and has nothing to do with any encouragement to people to marry. Emma had done. Her father was growing nervous, and could not understand her. Her mind returned to Mrs. Elton's offences, and long, very long, did they occupy her. End of Volume 2, Chapter 14 Read by Sibella Denton For more information, please visit LibriVox.org Volume Two, Chapter Fifteen of Emma by Jane Austen, read for LibriVox.org into the public domain. Emma was not required by any subsequent discovery to retract her ill opinion of Mrs. Elton. Her observation had been pretty correct. Such as Mrs. Elton appeared to her on this second interview, such she appeared whenever they met again, self-important, presuming, familiar, ignorant, and ill-bred. She had a little beauty and a little accomplishment, but so little judgment that she thought herself coming with superior knowledge of the world, to enliven and improve a country neighbourhood, and conceived Miss Hawkins to have held such a place in society as Mrs. Elton's consequence could only surpass. There was no reason to suppose Mr. Elton thought it all differently from his wife. He seemed not merely entirely happy with her, but proud. He had the air of congratulating himself on having brought such a woman to Highbury as not even Miss Woodhouse could equal, and the greater part of her new acquaintance, disposed to commend, or not in the habit of judging, following the lead of Miss Bates's good will, or taking it for granted that the bride must be as clever and as agreeable as she professed herself, were very well satisfied, so that Mrs. Elton's praise passed from one mouth to another as it ought to do, unimpeded by Miss Woodhouse, who readily continued her first contribution, and talked with a good grace of her being very pleasant and very elegantly dressed. In one respect Mrs. Elton grew even worse than she had appeared at first. Her feelings altered towards Emma. Offended, probably, by the little encouragement which her proposals of intimacy met with, she drew back in her turn, and gradually became much more cold and distant, and though the effect was agreeable, the ill-will which produced it was necessarily increasing Emma's dislike. Her manners, too, and Mr. Elton's, were unpleasant towards Harriet. They were sneering and negligent. Emma hoped it must rapidly work Harriet's cure, but the sensations which could prompt such behaviour sunk them both very much. It was not to be doubted that poor Harriet's attachment had been an offering to conjugal unreserve, and her own share in the story, under a colouring the least favourable to her, and the most soothing to him, had in all likelihood been given also. She was, of course, the object of their joint dislike. When they had nothing else to say, it must always be easy to begin abusing Miss Woodhouse, and the enmity, which they dared not show in open disrespect to her, found a broader vent in contemptuous treatment of Harriet. Mrs. Elton took a great fancy to Jane Fairfax, and from the first. Not merely when a state of warfare with one young lady might be supposed to recommend the other, but from the very first, and she was not satisfied with expressing natural and reasonable admiration, but without solicitude or plea or privilege she must be wanting to assist and befriend her. Before Emma had forfeited her confidence, and about the third time of their meeting, she heard all Mrs. Elton's night errantry on the subject. "'Jane Fairfax is absolutely charming, Miss Woodhouse. I quite rave about Jane Fairfax. A sweet, interesting creature, so mild and ladylike, and with such talents. I assure you, I think she has very extraordinary talents. I do not scruple to say that she plays extremely well.' I know enough of music to speak decidedly on that point. Oh, she is absolutely charming. You will laugh at my warmth, but upon my word I talk of nothing but Jane Fairfax, and her situation is so calculated to affect one. 
"'Miss Woodhouse, we must exert ourselves and endeavour to do something for her. We must bring her forward. Such a talent as hers must not be suffered to remain unknown. I dare say you have heard those charming lines of the poet, "'Full many a flower is born to blush unseen, and waste its fragrance on the desert air.' We must not allow them to be verified in sweet Jane Fairfax. "'I cannot think there is any danger of it,' was Emma's calm answer. "'And when you are better acquainted with Miss Fairfax's situation, and understand what her home has been, with Colonel and Mrs. Campbell, I have no idea that you will suppose her talents can be unknown. "'Oh, but dear Miss Woodhouse, she is now in such retirement, such obscurity, so thrown away. Whatever advantages she may have enjoyed with the Campbells are so palpably at an end. And I think she feels it. I am sure she does. She is very timid and silent. One can see that she feels the want of encouragement. I like her the better for it. I must confess it is a recommendation to me. I am a great advocate for timidity, and I am sure one does not often meet with it. But in those who are at all inferior it is extremely prepossessing. Oh, I assure you, Jane Fairfax is a very delightful character, and interests me more than I can express." "'You appear to feel a great deal, but I am not aware how you or any of Miss Fairfax's acquaintance here, any of those who have known her longer than yourself, can show her any other attention than, "'My dear Miss Woodhouse, a vast deal may be done by those who dare to act. You and I need not be afraid. If we set the example, many will follow it as far as they can, though not all have our situations.' We have carriages to fetch and convey her home, and we live in a style which could not make the addition of Jane Fairfax at any time the least inconvenient. I should be extremely displeased if Wright were to send us up such a dinner as could make me regret having asked more than Jane Fairfax to partake of it. I have no idea of that sort of thing. It is not likely that I should, considering what I have been used to. My greatest danger, perhaps, in housekeeping may be quite the other way— in doing too much, and being too careless of expense. Maple Grove will probably be my model more than it ought to be, for we do not at all affect to equal my brother, Mr. Suckling, in income. However, my resolution is taken as to noticing Jane Fairfax. I shall certainly have her very often at my house, shall certainly introduce her wherever I can, shall have musical parties to draw out her talents, and shall be constantly on the watch for an eligible situation." My acquaintance is so very extensive that I have little doubt of hearing of something to suit her shortly. I shall introduce her, of course, very particularly to my brother and sister when they come to us. I am sure they will like her extremely, and when she gets a little acquainted with them, her fears will completely wear off, for there is nothing in the manners of either but what is highly conciliating. I shall have her very often indeed while they are with me. I dare say we shall sometimes find a seat for her in the Barouche Landau, in some of our exploring parties. "'Poor Jane Fairfax,' thought Emma. "'You have not deserved this. You may have done wrong with regard to Mr. Dixon, but this is a punishment beyond what you can have merited. The kindness and protection of Mrs. Elton. Jane Fairfax and Jane Fairfax. Heavens! Let me not suppose that she dares go about Emma Woodhousing me.' but upon my honour there seems no limit to the licentiousness of that woman's tongue. Emma had not to listen to such paradings again, to any so exclusively addressed to herself, so disgustingly decorated with a dear Miss Woodhouse. The change on Mrs. Elton's side soon afterwards appeared, and she was left in peace, neither forced to be the very particular friend of Mrs. Elton, nor, under Mrs. Elton's guidance, the very active patroness of Jane Fairfax, and only sharing with others in a general way, in knowing what was felt, what was mediated, what was done. She looked on with some amusement. Miss Bates's gratitude for Mrs. Elton's attentions to Jane was in the first style of guileless simplicity and warmth. She was quite one of her worthies, the most amiable, affable, delightful woman, just as accomplished and condescending as Mrs. Elton meant to be considered. Emma's only surprise was that Jane Fairfax should accept those attentions, and tolerate Mrs. Elton as she seemed to do. She heard of her walking with the Eltons, sitting with the Eltons, spending a day with the Eltons. This was astonishing. She could not have believed it possible that the taste or pride of Miss Fairfax could endure such society and friendship as the vicarage had to offer. "'She is a riddle, quite a riddle,' said she, "'to choose to remain here month after month, after privations of every sort.' 
and now to choose the mortification of Mrs. Elton's notice, and the penury of her conversation, rather than return to the superior companions who have always loved her with such real, generous affection. Jane had come to Highbury professedly for three months. The Campbells were gone to Ireland for three months. But now the Campbells had promised their daughter to stay at least till midsummer, and fresh invitations had arrived for her to join them there. According to Miss Bates, it all came from her, Mrs. Dixon had written most pressingly. Would Jane but go, means were to be found, servants sent, friends contrived, no travelling difficulty allowed to exist, but still she had declined it. She must have some motive more powerful than appears for refusing this invitation, was Emma's conclusion. She must be under some sort of penance, inflicted either by the Campbells or herself. There is great fear, great caution, great resolution somewhere. She is not to be with the Dixons. The decree is issued by somebody. But why must she consent to be with the Eltons? Here is quite a separate puzzle. Upon her speaking her wonder aloud on that part of the subject, before the few who knew her opinion of Mrs. Elton, Mrs. Weston ventured this apology for Jane. "'We cannot suppose that she has any great enjoyment at the vicarage, my dear Emma, but it is better than being always at home. Her aunt is a good creature, but as a constant companion must be very tiresome. We must consider what Miss Fairfax quits, before we condemn her taste for what she goes to.' "'You are right, Mrs. Weston,' said Mr. Knightley warmly. "'Miss Fairfax is as capable as any of us of forming a just opinion of Mrs. Elton. Could she have chosen with whom to associate, she would not have chosen her. But,' with a reproachful smile at Emma, "'she receives attentions from Mrs. Elton, which nobody else pays her.' Emma felt that Mrs. Weston was giving her a momentary glance, and she was herself struck by his warmth. With a faint blush she presently replied, such attentions as Mrs. Elton's, I should have imagined, would rather disgust than gratify Miss Fairfax. Mrs. Elton's invitations, I should have imagined, anything but inviting. I should not wonder, said Mrs. Weston, if Miss Fairfax were to have been drawn on beyond her own inclination, by her aunt's eagerness in accepting Mrs. Elton's civilities for her. Poor Miss Bates may very likely have committed her niece, and hurried her into a greater appearance of intimacy than her own good sense would have dictated, in spite of the very natural wish of a little change. Both felt rather anxious to hear him speak again, and after a few minutes' silence, he said, "'Another thing must be taken into consideration, too. Mrs. Elton does not talk to Miss Fairfax as she speaks of her. We all know the difference between the pronouns he or she and thou, the plainest spoken among us, we all feel the influence of a something beyond common civility in our personal intercourse with each other, something more early implanted. We cannot give anybody the disagreeable hints that we may have been very full of the hour before. We feel things differently. And besides, the operation of this, as a general principle, you may be sure that Miss Fairfax awes Mrs. Elton by her superiority both of mind and manner, and that face to face Mrs. Elton treats her with all the respect which she has a claim to. Such a woman as Jane Fairfax probably never fell in Mrs. Elton's way before, and no degree of vanity can prevent her acknowledging her own comparative littleness in action, if not in consciousness. "'I know how highly you think of Jane Fairfax,' said Emma. Little Henry was in her thoughts, and a mixture of alarm and delicacy made her irresolute what to say. "'Yes,' he replied, "'anybody may know how highly I think of her.' "'And yet,' said Emma, beginning hastily, and with an arch look, but soon stopping it, it was better, however, to know the worst at once, she hurried on, "'and yet, perhaps, you may hardly be aware yourself how highly it is. The extent of your admiration may take you by surprise, some day or other.' Mr. Knightley was hard at work upon the lower buttons of his thick leather gaiters, and either the exertion of getting them together, or some other cause, brought the colour into his face, as he answered, "'Oh, are you there? But you are miserably behindhand. Mr. Cole gave me a hint of it six weeks ago.' He stopped. Emma felt her foot pressed by Mrs. Weston, and did not herself know what to think. In a moment he went on. "'That will never be, however, I can assure you. Miss Fairfax, I dare say, would not have me if I were to ask her, and I am very sure I shall never ask her.' Emma returned her friend's pressure with interest, and was pleased enough to exclaim, you are not vain, Mr. Knightley, I will say that for you. He seemed hardly to hear her, he was thoughtful, and in a manner which showed him not pleased, soon afterwards said, So, you have been settling that I should marry Jane Fairfax? No, indeed, I have not. 
You have scolded me too much for matchmaking for me to presume to take such a liberty with you. What I said just now meant nothing. One says those sorts of things, of course, without any idea of a serious meaning. Oh, no, upon my word, I have not the smallest wish for your marrying Jane Fairfax or Jane anybody. You would not come in and sit with us in this comfortable way if you were married. Mr. Knightley was thoughtful again. The result of his reverie was, No, Emma, I do not think the extent of my admiration for her will ever take me by surprise. I never had a thought of her in that way, I assure you. And soon afterwards, Jane Fairfax is a very charming young woman, but not even Jane Fairfax is perfect. She has a fault. She has not the open temper which a man would wish for in a wife. Emma could not but rejoice to hear that she had a fault. Well, said she, and you soon silenced Mr. Cole, I suppose? Yes, very soon. He gave me a quiet hint. I told him he was mistaken. He asked my pardon, and said no more. Cole does not wish to be wiser or wittier than his neighbors. In that respect, how unlike dear Mrs. Elton, who wants to be wiser and wittier than all the world! I wonder how she speaks of the Coles, what she calls them. How can she find any appellation for them, deep enough in familiar vulgarity? She calls you nightly. What can she do for Mr. Cole? And so am I not to be surprised that Jane Fairfax accepts her civilities and consents to be with her? Mrs. Weston, your argument weighs most with me. I can much more readily enter into the temptation of getting away from Miss Bates than I can believe in the triumph of Miss Fairfax's mind over Mrs. Elton. I have no faith in Mrs. Elton's acknowledging herself the inferior in thought, word, or deed, or in her being under any restraint beyond her own scanty rule of good breeding. I cannot imagine that she will not be continually insulting her visitor with praise, encouragement, and offers of service, that she will not be continually detailing her magnificent intentions, from the procuring her a permanent situation, to the including her in those delightful exploring parties which are to take place in the Barouche Landau. "'Jane Fairfax has feeling,' said Mr. Knightley. "'I do not accuse her of want of feeling.' Her sensibilities, I suspect, are strong, and her temper excellent in its power of forbearance, patience, self-control, but it wants openness. She is reserved, more reserved, I think, than she used to be, and I love an open temper. No, till Cole alluded to my supposed attachment, it had never entered my head. I saw Jane Fairfax and conversed with her, with admiration and pleasure always, but with no thought beyond. "'Well, Mrs. Weston,' said Emma triumphantly, when he left them, what do you say now to Mr. Knightley's marrying Jane Fairfax? Why, really, dear Emma, I say that he is so very much occupied by the idea of not being in love with her, that I should not wonder if it were to end in his being so at last. Do not beat me. End of Volume 2, Chapter 15 Read by Sibella Denton For more information, please visit LibriVox.org Volume two, chapter sixteen of Emma by Jane Austen. Read for LibriVox.org into the public domain. Everybody in and about Highbury who had ever visited Mr. Elton was disposed to pay him attention on his marriage. Dinner parties and evening parties were made for him and his lady, and invitations flowed in so fast that she had soon the pleasure of apprehending that they were never to have a disengaged day. I see how it is, said she. I see what a life I am to lead among you. "'Upon my word, we shall be absolutely dissipated. "'We really seem quite the fashion. "'If this is living in the country, it is nothing very formidable. "'From Monday to next Saturday, I assure you, we have not a disengaged day. "'A woman with fewer resources than I have need not have been at a loss.' "'No invitation came amiss to her. "'Her bath habits made evening parties perfectly natural to her, "'and Maple Grove had given her a taste for dinners.' She was a little shocked at the want of two drawing-rooms, at the poor attempt at rout-cakes, and there being no ice in the Highbury card-parties. Mrs. Bates, Mrs. Perry, Mrs. Goddard, and others, were a good deal behindhand in knowledge of the world, but she would soon show them how everything ought to be arranged. In the course of the spring she must return their civilities by one very superior party, in which her card-tables should be set out with their separate candles and unbroken packs in the true style, and more waiters engaged for the evening than their own establishment could furnish, to carry round the refreshments at exactly the proper hour, and in the proper order. Emma, in the meanwhile, could not be satisfied without a dinner at Hartfield for the Eltons. They must not do less than others, or she should be exposed to odious suspicions, 
and imagined capable of pitiful resentment. A dinner there must be. After Emma had talked about it for ten minutes, Mr. Woodhouse felt no unwillingness, and only made the usual stipulation of not sitting at the bottom of the table himself, with the usual regular difficulty of deciding who should do it for him. The persons to be invited required little thought. Besides the Eltons, it must be the Westons and Mr. Knightley, so far as it was all, of course, and it was hardly less inevitable that poor little Harriet must be asked to make the eighth. But this invitation was not given with equal satisfaction, and on many accounts Emma was particularly pleased by Harriet's begging to be allowed to decline it. She would rather not be in his company more than she could help. She was not yet quite able to see him and his charming, happy wife together without feeling uncomfortable. If Miss Woodhouse would not be displeased, she would rather stay at home. It was precisely what Emma would have wished, and she deemed it possible enough for wishing. She was delighted with the fortitude of her little friend, for fortitude she knew it was in her to give up being in company and stay at home, and she could now invite the very person whom she really wanted to make the eighth, Jane Fairfax. Since her last conversation with Mrs. Weston and Mr. Knightley, she was more conscience-stricken about Jane Fairfax than she had often been. Mr. Knightley's words dwelt with her. He had said that Jane Fairfax received attentions from Mrs. Elton which nobody else paid her. "'This is very true,' said she, "'at least as far as relates to me, which was all that was meant, and it is very shameful. Of the same age, and always knowing her, I ought to have been more her friend. She will never like me now. I have neglected her too long. But I will show her greater attention than I have done.' Every invitation was successful. They were all disengaged and all happy. The preparatory interest of this dinner, however, was not yet over. A circumstance rather unlucky occurred. The two eldest little Knightleys were engaged to pay their grandpapa and aunt a visit of some weeks in the spring, and their papa now proposed bringing them and staying one whole day at Hartfield, which one day would be the very day of this party. His professional engagements did not allow of his being put off, but both father and daughter were disturbed by its happening so. Mr. Woodhouse considered eight persons at dinner together as the utmost that his nerves could bear, and here would be a ninth, and Emma apprehended that it would be a ninth very much out of humour at not being able to come even to Hartfield for forty-eight hours, without falling in with a dinner-party. She comforted her father better than she would comfort herself, by representing that though he certainly would make them nine, yet he always said so little that the increase of noise would be very immaterial. She thought it, in reality, a sad exchange for herself, to have him with his grave looks and reluctant conversation opposed to her, instead of his brother. The event was more favourable to Mr. Woodhouse than to Emma. John Knightley came, but Mr. Weston was unexpectedly summoned to town, and must be absent on the very day. He might be able to join them in the evening, but certainly not to dinner. Mr. Woodhouse was quite at ease, and the seeing him so, with the arrival of the little boys and the philosophic composure of her brother on hearing his fate, removed the chief of even Emma's vexation. The day came, the party were punctually assembled, and Mr. John Knightley seemed early to devote himself to the business of being agreeable. Instead of drawing his brother off to a window while they waited for dinner, he was talking to Miss Fairfax. Mrs. Elton, as elegant as lace and pearls could make her, he looked at in silence, wanting only to observe enough for Isabella's information. But Miss Fairfax was an old acquaintance, and a quiet girl, and he could talk to her. He had met her before breakfast as he was returning from a walk with his little boys, when it had been just beginning to rain. It was natural to have some civil hopes on the subject, and he said, "'I hope you did not venture far, Miss Fairfax, this morning, or I am sure you must have been wet. We scarcely got home in time. I hope you turn directly.' I went only to the post-office, said she, and reached home before the rain was much. It is my daily errand. I always fetch the letters when I am here. It saves trouble, and is a something to get me out. A walk before breakfast does me good. Not a walk in the rain, I should imagine. No, but it did not absolutely rain when I set out. Mr. John Knightley smiled and replied, That is to say, you chose to have your walk, for you were not six yards from your own door when I had the pleasure of meeting you, and Henry and John had seen more drops than they could count long before. The post-office has a great charm at one period of our lives. When you have lived to my age, you will begin to think letters are never worth going through the rain for. There was a little blush, and then this answer. I must not hope to be ever situated as you are, in the midst of every dearest connection, 
and therefore I cannot expect that simply growing older should make me indifferent about letters. Indifferent? Oh, no, I never conceived you could become indifferent. Letters are no matter of indifference. They are generally a very positive curse. You are speaking of letters of business. Mine are letters of friendship. I have often thought them the worst of the two, he replied coolly. Business, you know, may bring money, but friendship hardly ever does. Ah, you are not serious now. I know Mr. John Knightley too well. I am sure he understands the value of friendship as well as anybody. I can easily believe that letters are very little to you, much less than to me, but it is not your being ten years older than myself which makes the difference. It is not age, but situation. You have everybody dearest to you always at hand. I, probably, never shall again, and therefore, till I have outlived all my affections, a post-office, I think, must always have power to draw me out, in worse weather than to-day. "'When I talked of your being altered by time, by the progress of years,' said John Knightley, "'I meant to imply the change of situation which time usually brings. I consider one as including the other. Time will generally lessen the interest of every attachment not within the daily circle, but that is not the change I had in view for you. As an old friend you will allow me to hope, Miss Fairfax, that ten years hence you may have as many concentrated objects as I have.' It was kindly said, and very far from giving offence. A pleasant thank you seemed meant to laugh it off, but a blush, a quivering lip, a tear in the eye, showed that it was felt beyond a laugh. Her attention was now claimed by Mr. Woodhouse, who, being, according to his custom on such occasions, making the circle of his guests, and paying his particular compliments to the ladies, was ending with her, and with all his mildest urbanity said, "'I am very sorry to hear, Miss Fairfax, of your being out this morning in the rain. Young ladies should take care of themselves.' young ladies are delicate plants. They should take care of their health and their complexion. My dear, did you change your stockings? Yes, sir, I did indeed, and I am very much obliged by your kind solicitude about me. My dear Miss Fairfax, young ladies are very sure to be cared for. I hope your good grandmamma and aunt are well. They are some of my very old friends. I wish my health allowed me to be a better neighbour. You do us a great deal of honour to-day, I am sure." My daughter and I are both highly sensible of your goodness, and have the greatest satisfaction in seeing you at Hartfield. The kind-hearted, polite old man might then sit down and feel that he had done his duty, and made every fair lady welcome and easy. By this time the walk in the rain had reached Mrs. Elton, and her remonstrances now opened upon Jane. "'My dear Jane, what is this I hear? Going to the post-office in the rain. This must not be, I assure you. "'You sad girl! How could you do such a thing? It is a sign I was not there to take care of you.' Jane very patiently assured her that she had not caught any cold. "'Oh, do not tell me. You really are a very sad girl, and do not know how to take care of yourself. To the post-office, indeed. Mrs. Weston, did you ever hear the like? You and I must positively exert our authority.' "'My advice,' said Mrs. Weston, kindly and persuasively, "'I certainly do feel tempted to give.' "'Miss Fairfax, you must not run such risks. Liable as you have been to severe colds, indeed you ought to be particularly careful, especially at this time of year. The spring, I always think, requires more than common care. Better wait an hour or two, or even half a day for your letters, than run the risk of bringing on your cough again. Now, do not you feel that you had? Yes, I am sure you are much too reasonable. You look as if you would not do such a thing again.' "'Oh, she shall not do such a thing again,' eagerly rejoined Mrs. Elton. "'We will not allow her to do such a thing again,' and nodding significantly. "'There must be some arrangement made. There must, indeed. I shall speak to Mr. E. The man who fetches our letters every morning, one of our men, I forget his name, shall inquire for yours, too, and bring them to you. That will obviate all difficulties, you know, and from us I really think, my dear Jane, you can have no scruple to accept such an accommodation.' "'You are extremely kind,' said Jane, "'but I cannot give up my early walk. "'I am advised to be out of doors as much as I can, "'and I must walk somewhere, "'and the post-office is an object, "'and upon my word I have scarcely ever had a bad morning before. "'My dear Jane, say no more about it. "'The thing is determined. "'That is,' laughing affectedly, "'as far as I can presume to determine anything "'without the concurrence of my lord and master.' "'You know, Mrs. Weston, you and I must be cautious how we express ourselves. "'But I do flatter myself, my dear Jane, that my influence is not entirely worn out. 
If I meet with no insuperable difficulties, therefore, consider that point as settled. Excuse me, said Jane earnestly, I cannot by any means consent to such an arrangement, so needlessly troublesome to your servant. If the errand were not a pleasure to me, it could be done, as it is always done when I am not here, by my grandmamma's. Oh, my dear, but so much as Patty has to do, and it is a kindness to employ our men. Jane looked as if she did not mean to be conquered, but instead of answering she began speaking again to Mr. John Knightley. "'The post-office is such a wonderful establishment,' said she, "'the regularity and dispatch of it. If one thinks of all that it has to do, and all that it does so well, it is really astonishing. It is certainly very well regulated. So seldom that any negligence or blunder appears, so seldom that a letter, among the thousands that are constantly passing about the kingdom, is even carried wrong, and not one in a million, I suppose, actually lost.' and when one considers the variety of hands, and of bad hands, too, that are to be deciphered, it increases the wonder. The clerks grow expert from habit. They must begin with some quickness of sight and hand, and exercise improves them. If you want any further explanation, continued he, smiling, they are paid for it. That is the key to a great deal of capacity. The public pays, and must be served well. The varieties of handwriting were farther talked of, and the usual observations made. I have heard it asserted, said John Knightley, that the same sort of handwriting often prevails in a family, and where the same master teaches it is natural enough. But for that reason I should imagine the likeness must be chiefly confined to the females, for boys have very little teaching after an early age, and scramble into any hand they can get. Isabella and Emma, I think, do write very much alike. I have not always known their writing apart." Yes, said his brother, hesitatingly, there is a likeness. I know what you mean, but Emma's hand is the strongest. Isabella and Emma both write beautifully, said Mr. Woodhouse, and always did, and so does poor Mrs. Weston, with half a sigh and half a smile at her. I never saw any gentleman's handwriting, Emma began, looking also at Mrs. Weston, but stopped, on perceiving that Mrs. Weston was attending to someone else, and the pause gave her time to reflect. Now, how am I going to introduce him? Am I unequal to speaking his name at once before all these people? Is it necessary for me to use any roundabout phrase? Your Yorkshire friend, your correspondent in Yorkshire. That would be the way, I suppose, if I were very bad. No, I can pronounce his name without the smallest distress. I certainly get better and better. Now for it. Mrs. Weston was disengaged, and Emma began again. Mr. Frank Churchill writes one of the best gentleman's hands I ever saw. I do not admire it, said Mr. Knightley. It is too small, wants strength. It is like a woman's writing. This was not to be submitted to by either lady. They vindicated him against the based aspersion. No, it by no means wanted strength. It was not a large hand, but very clear and certainly strong. Had not Mrs. Weston any letter about her to produce? No, she had heard from him very lately, but having answered the letter, had put it away. "'If we were in the other room,' said Emma, "'if I had my writing-desk, I am sure I could produce a specimen. "'I have a note of his. "'Do not you remember, Mrs. Weston, employing him to write for you one day?' "'He chose to say he was employed. "'Well, well, I have that note, and can show it after dinner to convince Mr. Knightley.' "'Oh, when a gallant young man, like Mr. Frank Churchill,' said Mr. Knightley dryly, "'writes to a fair lady like Miss Woodhouse, he will, of course, put forth his best.' "'Dinner was on the table.' Mrs. Elton, before she could be spoken to, was ready, and before Mr. Woodhouse had reached her with his request to be allowed to hand her into the dining-parlour, was saying, "'Must I go first? I am really ashamed of always leading the way.' Jane's solicitude about fetching her own letters had not escaped Emma. She had heard and seen it all, and felt some curiosity to know whether the wet walk of this morning had produced any. She suspected that it had, that it would not have been so resolutely encountered but in full expectation of hearing from some one very dear, and that it had not been in vain. She thought there was an air of greater happiness than usual, a glow both of complexion and spirits. She could have made an inquiry or two as to the expedition and the expense of the Irish mails. It was at her tongue's end, but she abstained. She was quite determined not to utter a word that should hurt Jane Fairfax's feelings, and they followed the other ladies out of the room, arm in arm, with an appearance of goodwill highly becoming to the beauty and grace of each. End of Volume 2 Chapter 16 Read by Sibella Denton
For more information, please visit LibriVox.org. Volume 2, Chapter 17 of Emma by Jane Austen. Read for LibriVox.org into the public domain. When the ladies returned to the drawing-room after dinner, Emma found it hardly possible to prevent their making two distinct parties. With so much perseverance in judging and behaving ill, did Mrs. Elton engross Jane Fairfax and slight herself. She and Mrs. Weston were obliged to be almost always either talking together or silent together. Mrs. Elton left them no choice. If Jane repressed her for a little time, she soon began again, and, though much that passed between them was in a half-whisper, especially on Mrs. Elton's side, there was no avoiding a knowledge of their principal subjects. The post-office, catching cold, fetching letters, and friendship, were long under discussion, and to them succeeded one, which must be at least equally unpleasant to Jane, inquiries whether she had yet heard of any situation likely to suit her, and professions of Mrs. Elton's mediated activity. "'Here is April come,' said she. "'I get quite anxious about you. June will soon be here.' "'But I have never fixed on June or any other month, merely looked forward to the summer in general.' "'But have you really heard of nothing? I have not even made any inquiry. I do not wish to make any yet. Oh, my dear, we cannot begin too early. You are not aware of the difficulty of procuring exactly the desirable thing.' "'I not aware,' said Jane, shaking her head. "'Dear Mrs. Elton, who can have thought of it as I have done?' "'But you have not seen so much of the world as I have. You do not know how many candidates there always are for first situations.' I saw a vast deal of that in the neighbourhood round Maple Grove. A cousin of Mr. Suckling, Mrs. Bragg, had such an affinity of applications. Everybody was anxious to be in her family, for she moves in the first circle. Wax candles in the schoolroom! You may imagine how desirable. Of all houses in the kingdom, Mrs. Bragg's is the one I would most wish to see you in. "'Colonel and Mrs. Campbell are to be in town again by midsummer,' said Jane. "'I must spend some time with them. I am sure they will want it. Afterwards I may probably be glad to dispose of myself. But I would not wish you to take the trouble of making any inquiries at present.' "'Trouble? I, I know your scruples. You are afraid of giving me trouble. But I assure you, my dear Jane, the Campbells can hardly be more interested about you than I am.' I shall write to Mrs. Partridge in a day or two, and shall give her a strict charge to be on the lookout for anything eligible. Thank you, but I would rather you did not mention the subject to her till the time draws nearer. I do not wish to be giving anybody trouble. But, my dear child, the time is drawing near. Here is April and June, or say even July, is very near, with such business to accomplish before us. Your inexperience really amuses me. A situation such as you deserve, and your friends would require for you, is no everyday occurrence, is not obtained at a moment's notice. Indeed, indeed, we must begin inquiring directly. Excuse me, ma'am, but this is by no means my intention. I make no inquiry myself, and should be sorry to have any made by my friends. When I am quite determined as to the time, I am not at all afraid of being long employed. There are places in town, offices, where inquiry would soon produce something, offices for the sale, not quite of human flesh, but of human intellect. Oh, my dear, human flesh! You quite shock me if you mean a fling at the slave trade, I assure you. Mr. Suckling was always rather a friend to the abolition. I did not mean, I was not thinking of the slave trade, replied Jane. Governess trade, I assure you, was all that I had in view, widely differing, certainly, as to the guilt of those who carry it on. But, as to the greater misery of the victims, I do not know where it lies." but I only mean to say that there are advertising offices, and that by applying to them I should have no doubt of very soon meeting with something that would do. "'Something that would do?' repeated Mrs. Elton. "'Aye, that may suit your humble ideas of yourself. I know what a modest creature you are. But it will not satisfy your friends to have you taking up with anything that may offer, any inferior, commonplace situation, in a family not moving in a certain circle, or able to command the elegancies of life.' You are very obliging, but as to all that I am very indifferent. It would be no object to me to be with the rich. My mortifications, I think, would only be the greater. I should suffer more from comparison. A gentleman's family is all that I should condition for. I know you, I know you. You would take up with anything, but I shall be a little more nice. 
and I am sure the good Campbells will be quite on my side. With your superior talents, you have a right to move in the first circle. Your musical knowledge alone would entitle you to name your own terms, have as many rooms as you like, and mix in the family as much as you chose. That is, I do not know, if you knew the harp, you might do all that, I am sure. But you sing as well as play. Yes, I really believe you might, even without the harp, stipulate for what you chose, and you must and shall be delightfully, honourably, and comfortably settled before the Campbells or I have any rest. You may well class the delight, the honour, and the comfort of such a situation together, said Jane. They are pretty sure to be equal. However, I am very serious in not wishing anything to be attempted at present for me. I am exceedingly obliged to you, Mrs. Elton. I am obliged to anybody who feels for me, but I am quite serious in wishing nothing to be done till the summer. For two or three months longer I shall remain where I am, and as I am. "'And I am quite serious, too, I assure you,' replied Mrs. Elton, gaily, "'in resolving to be always on the watch, and employing my friends to watch also, that nothing really unexceptionable may pass us.' In this style she ran on, never thoroughly stopped by anything, till Mr. Woodhouse came into the room. Her vanity then had a change of object, and Emma heard her saying in the same half-whisper to Jane, "'Here comes this dear old beau of mine, I protest. Only think of his gallantry in coming away before the other men. What a dear creature he is! I assure you I like him excessively. I admire all that quaint, old-fashioned politeness. It is much more to my taste than modern ease. Modern ease often disgusts me. But this good old Mr. Woodhouse— I wish you had heard his gallant speeches to me at dinner. Oh, I assure you, I begin to think my caro sposa would be absolutely jealous. I fancy I am rather a favourite. He took notice of my gown. How do you like it? Selina's choice. Handsome, I think, but I do not know whether it is not over-trimmed. I have the greatest dislike to the idea of being over-trimmed, quite a horror of finery. I must put on a few ornaments now, because it is expected of me. A bride, you know, must appear like a bride, but my natural taste is all for simplicity. A simple style of dress is so infinitely preferable to finery. But I am quite in the minority, I believe. Few people seem to value simplicity of dress. Show and finery are everything. I have some notion of putting such a trimming as this to my white and silver poplin. Do you think it will look well? The whole party were but just reassembled in the drawing-room when Mr. Weston made his appearance among them. He had returned to a late dinner, and walked to Hartfield as soon as it was over. He had been too much expected by the best judges, for surprise, but there was great joy. Mr. Woodhouse was almost as glad to see him now, as he would have been sorry to see him before. John Knightley was in mute astonishment, that a man who might have spent his evening quietly at home, after a day of business in London, should set off again, and walk half a mile to another man's house, for the sake of being in mixed company till bedtime of finishing his day in the efforts of civility and the noise of numbers, was a circumstance to strike him deeply. A man who had been in motion since eight o'clock that morning, and who might now have been still, who had been long talking, and might have been silent, who had been in more than one crowd, and might have been alone, such a man, to quit the tranquillity and independence of his own fireside, and on the evening of a cold, sleety April day, rush out again into the world, could he by a touch of his finger have instantly taken back his wife there would have been a motive but his coming would probably prolong rather than break up the party john knightley looked at him with amazement then shrugged his shoulders and said i could not have believed it even of him mr weston meanwhile perfectly unsuspicious of the indignation he was exciting happy and cheerful as usual and with all the right of being principal talker which a day spent anywhere from home confers was making himself agreeable among the rest and having satisfied the inquiries of his wife as to his dinner convincing her that none of all her careful directions to the servants had been forgotten and spread abroad what public news he had heard was proceeding to a family communication, which, though principally addressed to Mrs. Weston, he had not the smallest doubt of being highly interesting to everybody in the room. He gave her a letter, it was from Frank, and to herself, he had met with it in his way, and had taken the liberty of opening it. "'Read it, read it,' said he. "'It will give you pleasure. Only a few lines. Will not take you long. Read it to Emma.' The two ladies looked over it together, and he sat smiling and talking to them the whole time, in a voice a little subdued, but very audible to everybody. "'Well, he is coming. Good news, I think. Well, what do you say to it? I always told you he would be here again soon, did I not?' 
"'Anne, my dear, did I not always tell you so, and you would not believe me? In town next week, you see, at the latest, I dare say, for she is as impatient as the black gentleman when anything is to be done. Most likely they will be there to-morrow or Saturday. As to her illness, all nothing, of course, but it is an excellent thing to have Frank among us again, so near as town. They will stay a good while when they do come, and he will be half his time with us. This is precisely what I wanted.' "'Well, pretty good news, is it not? Have you finished it? Has Emma read it? Put it up, put it up. We will have a good talk about it some other time, but it will not do now. I shall only just mention the circumstance to the others in a common way.' Mrs. Weston was most comfortably pleased on the occasion. Her looks and words had nothing to restrain them. She was happy, she knew she was happy, and knew she ought to be happy. Her congratulations were warm and open, but Emma could not speak so fluently. She was a little occupied in weighing her own feelings, and trying to understand the degree of her agitation, which she rather thought was considerable. Mr. Weston, however, too eager to be very observant, too communicative to want others to talk, was very well satisfied with what she did say, and soon moved away to make the rest of his friends happy by a partial communication of what the whole room must have overheard already. It was well that he took everybody's joy for granted, or he might not have thought either Mr. Woodhouse or Mr. Knightley particularly delighted. They were the first entitled, after Mrs. Weston and Emma, to be made happy. From them he would have proceeded to Miss Fairfax, but she was so deep in conversation with John Knightley that it would have been too positive an interruption, and finding himself close to Mrs. Elton, and with her attention disengaged, he necessarily began on the subject with her. End of Volume 2, Chapter 17, read by Sibella Denton. For more information, please visit LibriVox.org. Volume 2, Chapter 18 of Emma by Jane Austen. Read for LibriVox.org into the public domain. I hope I shall soon have the pleasure of introducing my son to you, said Mr. Weston. Mrs. Elton, very willing to suppose a particular compliment intended to her by such a hope, smiled most graciously. "'You have heard of a certain Frank Churchill, I presume,' he continued, "'and know him to be my son, though he does not bear my name.' "'Oh, yes, and I shall be very happy in his acquaintance. I am sure Mr. Elton will lose no time in calling on him, and we shall both have great pleasure in seeing him at the vicarage. "'You are very obliging. Frank will be extremely happy, I am sure.' He is to be in town next week, if not sooner. We have notice of it in a letter to-day. I met the letters in my way this morning, and, seeing my son's hand, presumed to open it, though it was not directed to me. It was to Mrs. Weston. She is his principal correspondent, I assure you. I hardly ever get a letter. And so you absolutely opened what was directed to her. Oh, Mr. Weston, laughing affectedly, I must protest against that. A most dangerous precedent, indeed. I beg you will not let your neighbours follow your example— "'Upon my word, if this is what I am to expect, we married women must begin to exert ourselves. Oh, Mr. Weston, I could not have believed it of you. Ay, we men are sad fellows. You must take care of yourself, Mrs. Elton. This letter tells us, it is a short letter, written in a hurry, merely to give us notice. It tells us that they are all coming up to town directly, on Mrs. Churchill's account. She has not been well the whole summer, and thinks Enscombe too cold for her. So they are all to move southward without loss of time.' "'Indeed. From Yorkshire, I think. Enscombe is in Yorkshire?' "'Yes, they are about one hundred and ninety miles from London. A considerable journey.' "'Yes, upon my word, very considerable. Sixty-five miles farther than from Maple Grove to London.' "'But what is distance, Mr. Weston, to people of large fortune? You would be amazed to hear how my brother, Mr. Suckling, sometimes flies about. You will hardly believe me, but twice in one week he and Mr. Bragg went to London and back again with four horses.' The evil of the distance from Enscombe, said Mr. Weston, is that Mrs. Churchill, as we understand, has not been able to leave the sofa for a week together. In Frank's last letter she complained, he said, of being too weak to get into her conservatory without having both his arm and his uncle's. This, you know, speaks a great degree of weakness, but she is now so impatient to be in town that she means to sleep only two nights on the road. So Frank writes word. "'Certainly delicate ladies have very extraordinary constitutions, Mrs. Elton. "'You must grant me that.' "'No, indeed, I shall grant you nothing. "'I always take the part of my own sex. "'I do, indeed. "'I give you notice. "'You will find me a formidable antagonist on that point. 
I always stand up for women, and I assure you, if you knew how Selina feels with respect to sleeping at an inn, you would not wonder at Mrs. Churchill's making incredible exertions to avoid it. Selina says it is quite a horror to her, and I believe I have caught a little of her nicety. She always travels with her own sheets. An excellent precaution. Does Mrs. Churchill do the same? Depend upon it, Mrs. Churchill does everything that any other fine lady ever did. Mrs. Churchill will not be second to any lady in the land, for— Mrs. Elton eagerly interposed with, "'Oh, Mr. Weston, do not mistake me. Selina is no fine lady, I assure you. Do not run away with such an idea.' "'Is she not? Then she is no rule for Mrs. Churchill, who is as thorough a fine lady as anybody ever beheld.' Mrs. Elton began to think she had been wrong in disclaiming so warmly. It was by no means her object to have it believed that her sister was not a fine lady. Perhaps there was want of spirit in the pretense of it, and she was considering in what way she had best retract when Mr. Elton went on. "'Mrs. Churchill is not much in my good graces, as you may suspect, but this is quite between ourselves. She is very fond of Frank, and therefore I would not speak ill of her. Besides, she is out of health now, but that, indeed, by her own account, she has always been. I would not say so to everybody, Mrs. Elton, but I have not much faith in Mrs. Churchill's illness.' "'If she is really ill, why not go to Bath, Mr. Weston, to Bath or to Clifton? "'She has taken it into her head that Enscombe is too cold for her. "'The fact is, I suppose, that she is tired of Enscombe. "'She has now been a longer time stationary there than she ever was before, "'and she begins to want change. "'It is a retired place, a fine place, but very retired. "'Ay, like Maple Grove, I dare say. "'Nothing can stand more retired from the road than Maple Grove.' such an immense plantation all round it. You seem shut out from everything, in the most complete retirement, and Mrs. Churchill probably has not health or spirits like Selina to enjoy that sort of seclusion. Or perhaps she may not have resources enough in herself to be qualified for country life. I always say a woman cannot have too many resources, and I feel very thankful that I have so many myself as to be quite independent of society. Frank was here in February for fortnight. "'So I remember to have heard. "'He will find an addition to the Society of Highbury when he comes again. "'That is, if I may presume to call myself an addition. "'But perhaps he may never have heard of there being such a creature in the world.' "'This was too loud a call for a compliment to be passed by, "'and Mr. Weston, with a very good grace, immediately exclaimed, "'My dear madam, nobody but yourself could imagine such a thing possible. "'Not heard of you.' I believe Mrs. Weston's letters lately have been very full of little else than Mrs. Elton. He had done his duty and could return to his son. When Frank left us, continued he, it was quite uncertain when we might see him again, which makes this day's news doubly welcome. It has been completely unexpected. That is, I always had a strong persuasion he would be here again soon, but I was sure something favourable would turn up. But nobody believed me. He and Mrs. Weston were both dreadfully desponding. How could he contrive to come, and how could it be supposed that his uncle and aunt would spare him again, and so forth? I always felt that something would happen in our favour, and so it has, you see. I have observed, Mrs. Elton, in the course of my life, that if things are going untowardly one month, they are sure to mend the next. Very true, Mr. Weston, perfectly true. It is just what I used to say to a certain gentleman in company in the days of courtship, when, because things did not go quite right, did not proceed with all the rapidity which suited his feelings, he was apt to be in despair, and exclaimed that he was sure at this rate it would be May before Hyman's saffron robe would be put on for us. Oh, the pains I have been at to dispel these gloomy thoughts and give him cheerfuller views! The carriage, we had disappointments about the carriage, one morning, I remember, he came to me quite in despair." She was stopped by a slight fit of coughing, and Mr. Weston instantly seized the opportunity of going on. "'You were mentioning May. May is the very month which Mrs. Churchill is ordered, or has ordered herself, to spend in some warmer place than Enscombe. In short, to spend in London, that we have the agreeable prospect of frequent visits from Frank the whole spring. Precisely the season of the year which one should have chosen for it. Days almost at the longest, weather genial and pleasant, always inviting one out, and never too hot for exercise. When he was here before, we made the best of it, but there was a good deal of wet, damp, cheerless weather. There always is in February, you know, and we could not do half that we intended. 
now will be the time. This will be complete enjoyment, and I do not know, Mrs. Elton, whether the uncertainty of our meetings, the sort of constant expectation there will be of his coming in to-day or to-morrow, and at any hour, may not be more friendly to happiness than having him actually in the house. I think it is so. I think that it is the state of mind which gives most spirit and delight. I hope you will be pleased with my son, but you must not expect a prodigy. He is generally thought a fine young man, but do not expect a prodigy. Mrs. Weston's partiality for him is very great, and, as you may suppose, most gratifying to me. She thinks nobody equal to him. I assure you, Mr. Weston, I have very little doubt that my opinion will be decidedly in his favour. I have heard so much in praise of Mr. Frank Churchill. At the same time it is fair to observe that I am one of those who always judge for themselves, and are by no means implicitly guided by others. I give you notice that, as I find your son, so I shall judge of him. I am no flatterer. Mr. Weston was musing. I hope, said he presently, I have not been severe upon poor Mrs. Churchill. If she is ill, I should be sorry to do her injustice. But there are some traits of character which make it difficult for me to speak of her with the forbearance I could wish. You cannot be ignorant, Mrs. Elton, of my connection with the family, nor of the treatment I have met with, and between ourselves the whole blame of it is to be laid on her. She was the instigator. Frank's mother would never have been slighted as she was but for her. Mr. Churchill has pride, but his pride is nothing to his wife's. His is a quiet, indolent, gentlemanlike sort of pride that would harm nobody, and only make himself a little helpless and tiresome, but her pride is arrogance and insolence. And what inclines one less to bear, she has no fair pretense of blood or family. She was nobody when he married her, barely the daughter of a gentleman, but ever since her being turned into a Churchill she has out-Churchilled them all in high and mighty claims. But in herself, I assure you, she is an upstart. Only think! Well, that must be infinitely provoking. I have quite a horror of upstarts. Maple Grove has given me a thorough disgust for people of that sort, for there is a family in that neighbourhood who are such an annoyance to my brother and sister, from the airs they give themselves. Your description of Mrs. Churchill made me think of them directly. People of the name of Tupman, very lately settled there, and encumbered with many low connections, but giving themselves immense airs, and expecting to be on a footing with the old established families. A year and a half is the very utmost that they could have lived at West Hall, and how they got their fortune nobody knows. They came from Birmingham, which is not a place to promise much, you know, Mr. Weston. One has not great hopes from Birmingham. I always say there is something direful in the sound, but nothing more is positively known of the Tupmans, though a good many things, I assure you, are suspected, and yet by their manners they evidently think themselves equal even to my brother, Mr. Suckling, who happens to be one of their nearest neighbours. It is infinitely too bad. Mr. Suckling, who has been eleven years resident at Maple Grove, and whose father had it before him, I believe, at least, I am almost sure that old Mr. Suckling had completed the purchase before his death." They were interrupted. Tea was carrying round, and Mr. Weston, having said all that he wanted, soon took the opportunity of walking away. After tea, Mr. and Mrs. Weston and Mr. Elton sat down with Mr. Woodhouse to cards. The remaining five were left to their own powers, and Emma doubted their getting on very well, for Mr. Knightley seemed little disposed for conversation, Mrs. Elton was wanting notice, which nobody had inclination to pay, and she was herself in a worry of spirits which would have made her prefer being silent. Mr. John Knightley proved more talkative than his brother. He was to leave them early the next day, and he soon began with, "'Well, Emma, I do not believe I have anything more to say about the boys, but you have your sister's letter, and everything is down at full length there, we may be sure. My charge would be much more concise than hers, and probably not much in the same spirit. All that I have to recommend being compromised in, do not spoil them, and do not physic them.' I rather hope to satisfy you both, said Emma, for I shall do all in my power to make them happy, which will be enough for Isabella, and happiness must preclude false indulgence and physic. And if you find them troublesome, you must send them home again. That is very likely. You think so, do you not? I hope I am aware they may be too noisy for your father, or even may be some encumbrance to you, if your visiting engagements continue to increase as much as they have done lately. Increase? "'Certainly. You must be sensible that the last half-year has made a great difference in your way of life. Difference? No, indeed, I am not. There can be no doubt of your being much more engaged with company than you used to be. 
"'Witness this very time. Here I am come down for only one day, and you are engaged with the dinner-party. When did it happen before, or anything like it? Your neighbourhood is increasing, and you mix more with it. A little while ago every letter to Isabella brought an account of fresh gaieties, dinners at Mr. Cole's, or balls at the Crown. The difference which Randall's, Randall's alone makes in your goings-on, is very great.' "'Yes,' said his brother quickly, "'it is Randall's that does it all.' "'Very well. And as Randall's, I suppose, is not likely to have less influence than heretofore, it strikes me as a possible thing, Emma, that Henry and John may be sometimes in the way. And if they are, I only beg you to send them home.' "'No,' cried Mr. Knightley, "'that not need me the consequence. Let them be sent to Donwell. I shall certainly be at leisure.' "'Upon my word,' exclaimed Emma, "'you amuse me. I should like to know how many of all my numerous engagements take place without your being of the party, and why I am to be supposed in danger of wanting leisure to attend to the little boys. These amazing engagements of mine, what have they been? Dining once with the Coles, and having a ball talked of which never took place. I can understand you,' nodding at Mr. John Knightley, "'your good fortune in meeting with so many of your friends at once here delights you too much to pass unnoticed.' "'But you,' turning to Mr. Knightley, "'who know how very, very seldom I am ever two hours from Hartfield, "'why you should foresee such a series of dissipation for me, I cannot imagine. "'And as to my dear little boys, I must say that if Aunt Emma has not time for them, "'I do not think they would fare much better with Uncle Knightley, "'who is absent from home about five hours where she is absent one, "'and who, when he is at home, is either reading to himself or settling his accounts.' Mr. Knightley seemed to be trying not to smile, and succeeded without difficulty upon Mrs. Elton's beginning to talk to him. End of Volume 2, Chapter 18 Read by Sibella Denton For more information, please visit LibriVox.org Volume 3, Chapter 1 of Emma by Jane Austen Read for LibriVox.org into the public domain a very little quiet reflection was enough to satisfy Emma as to the nature of her agitation on hearing this news of Frank Churchill. She was soon convinced that it was not for herself she was feeling at all apprehensive or embarrassed. It was for him. Her own attachment had really subsided into a mere nothing. It was not worth thinking of. But if he, who had undoubtedly been always so much the most in love of the two, were to be returning with the same warmth of sentiment which she had taken away, it would be very distressing." If a separation of two months should not have cooled him, there were dangers and evils before her. Caution for him, and for herself, would be necessary. She did not mean to have her own affections entangled again, and it would be incumbent on her to avoid any encouragement of his. She wished she might be able to keep him from an absolute declaration. That would be so very painful a conclusion of their present acquaintance. And yet she could not help rather anticipating something decisive. She felt as if the spring would not pass without bringing a crisis, an event, a something to alter her present composed and tranquil state. It was not very long, though rather longer than Mr. Weston had foreseen, before she had the power of forming some opinion of Frank Churchill's feelings. The Enscombe family were not in town quite so soon as had been imagined, but he was at Highbury very soon afterwards. He rode down for a couple of hours. He could not yet do more but as he came from Randall's immediately to Hartfield, she could then exercise all her quick observation, and speedily determine how he was influenced, and how she must act. They met with the utmost friendliness. There could be no doubt of his great pleasure in seeing her, but she had an almost instant doubt of his caring for her as he had done, of his feeling the same tenderness in the same degree. She watched him well. It was a clear thing he was less in love than he had been, absence, with the conviction probably of her indifference, had produced this very natural and very desirable effect. He was in high spirits, as ready to talk and laugh as ever, and seemed delighted to speak of his former visit, and recur to old stories, and he was not without agitation. It was not in his calmness that she read his comparative difference. He was not calm, his spirits were evidently fluttered, there was restlessness about him. Lively as he was, it seemed a liveliness that did not satisfy himself, but what decided her belief on the subject was his staying only a quarter of an hour, and hurrying away to make other calls in Highbury. He had seen a group of old acquaintance in the street as he passed. He had not stopped, he would not stop for more than a word, but he had the vanity to think they would be disappointed if he did not call, and much as he wished to stay longer at Harfield, he must hurry off. 
She had no doubt as to his being less in love, but neither his agitated spirits, nor his hurrying away, seemed like a perfect cure, and she was rather inclined to think it implied a dread of her returning power, and a discreet resolution of not trusting himself with her long. This was the only visit from Frank Churchill in the course of ten days. He was often hoping, intending to come, but was always prevented. His aunt could not bear to have him leave her. Such was his own account at Randall's. If he were quite sincere, if he really tried to come, it was to be inferred that Mrs. Churchill's removal to London had been of no service to the willful or nervous part of her disorder. That she was really ill was very certain. He had declared himself convinced of it at Randall's. Though much might be fancy, he could not doubt, when he looked back, that she was in a weaker state of health than she had been half a year ago. He did not believe it to proceed from anything that care and medicine might not remove, or at least that she might not have many years of existence before her, but he could not be prevailed on, by all his father's doubts, to say that her complaints were merely imaginary, or that she was as strong as ever. It soon appeared that London was not the place for her. She could not endure its noise. Her nerves were under continual irritation and suffering, and by the ten days' end her nephew's letter to Randall's communicated a change of plan. They were going to remove immediately to Richmond. Mrs. Churchill had been recommended to the medical skill of an eminent person there, and had otherwise a fancy for the place. A ready-furnished house in a favourite spot was engaged, and much benefit expected from the change. Emma heard that Frank wrote in the highest spirits of this arrangement, and seemed most fully to appreciate the blessing of having two months before him of such near neighbourhood to so many dear friends, for the house was taken for May and June. She was told now that he wrote with the greatest confidence of being often with them, almost as often as he could even wish. Emma saw how Mr. Weston understood these joyous prospects. He was considering her as the source of all the happiness they offered. She hoped it was not so. Two months must bring it to the proof. Mr. Weston's own happiness was indisputable. He was quite delighted. It was the very circumstance he could have wished for. Now it would be really having Frank in their neighbourhood. What were nine miles to a young man, an hour's ride? He would be always coming over. The difference in that respect of Richmond and London was enough to make the whole difference of seeing him always, and seeing him never. Sixteen miles, nay, eighteen, it must be full eighteen to Manchester Street, was a serious obstacle. Were he ever able to get away, the day would be spent in coming and returning. There was no comfort in having him in London. He might as well be at Enscombe. But Richmond was the very distance for easy intercourse. Better than nearer. One good thing was immediately brought to a certainty by this removal, the ball at the Crown. It had not been forgotten before, but it had been acknowledged vain to attempt to fix a day. Now, however, it was absolutely to be. Every preparation was resumed, and very soon after the Churchills had removed to Richmond, a few lines from Frank, to say that his aunt felt already much better from the change, and that he had no doubt of being able to join them for twenty-four hours at any given time, induced them to name as early a day as possible. Mr. Weston's ball was to be a real thing. A very few to-morrows stood between the young people of Highbury and happiness. Mr. Woodhouse was resigned. The time of year lightened the evil to him. May was better for everything than February. Mrs. Bates was engaged to spend the evening at Hartfield. James had due notice, and he sanguinely hoped that neither dear little Henry nor dear little John would have anything the matter with them, while dear Emma were gone. End of Volume 3, Chapter 1 Read by Sibella Denton For more information, please visit LibriVox.org Volume Three, Chapter Two of Emma by Jane Austen, read for LibriVox.org into the public domain. No misfortune occurred again to prevent the ball. The day approached, the day arrived, and after a morning of some anxious watching, Frank Churchill, in all the certainty of his own self, reached Randall's before dinner, and everything was safe. No second meeting had there yet been between him and Emma. The room at the Crown was to witness it, but it would be better than a common meeting in a crowd. Mr. Weston had been so very earnest in his entreaties for her arriving there as soon as possible after themselves, for the purpose of taking her opinion as to the propriety and comfort of the rooms, before any other persons came, that she could not refuse him, and must therefore spend some quiet interval in the young man's company. She was to convey Harriet, and they drove to the Crown in good time, the Randalls' party just sufficiently before them. Frank Churchill seemed to have been on the watch, 
and though he did not say much, his eyes declared that he meant to have a delightful evening. They all walked about together, to see that everything was as it should be, and within a few minutes were joined by the contents of another carriage, which Emma could not hear the sound of at first without great surprise. "'So unreasonably early!' she was going to exclaim, but she presently found that it was a family of old friends, who were coming, like herself, by particular desire, to help Mr. Weston's judgment, and they were so very closely followed by another carriage of cousins, who had been entreated to come early with the same distinguishing earnestness, on the same errand, that it seemed as if half the company might soon be collected together for the purpose of preparatory inspection. Emma perceived that her taste was not the only taste on which Mr. Weston depended, and felt that to be the favourite and intimate of a man who had so many intimates and confidants was not the very first distinction in the scale of vanity. She liked his open manners, but a little less of open-heartedness would have made him a higher character. But not general friendship made a man what he ought to be. She could fancy such a man. The whole party walked about, and looked, and praised again, and then, having nothing else to do, formed a sort of half-circle round the fire, to observe in their various modes, till other subjects were started, that, though May, a fire in the evening was still very pleasant. Emma found that it was not Mr. Weston's fault that the number of privy councillors was not yet larger. They had stopped at Mrs. Bates's door to offer the use of their carriage, but the aunt and niece were to be brought by the Eltons. Frank was standing by her, but not steadily. There was a restlessness which showed a mind not at ease. He was looking about, he was going to the door, he was watching for the sound of other carriages, impatient to begin, or afraid of being always near her. Mrs. Elton was spoken of. "'I think she must be here soon,' said he. "'I have a great curiosity to see Mrs. Elton. I have heard so much of her. It cannot be long, I think, before she comes.' A carriage was heard. He was on the move immediately, but coming back, said, "'I am forgetting that I am not acquainted with her. I have never seen either Mr. or Mrs. Elton. I have no business to put myself forward.' Mr. and Mrs. Elton appeared, and all the smiles and the proprieties passed. "'But Miss Bates and Miss Fairfax,' said Mr. Weston, looking about, "'I thought you were bringing them.' The mistake had been slight. The carriage was sent for them now. Emma longed to know what Frank's first opinion of Mrs. Elton might be, how he was affected by the studied elegance of her dress, and her smiles of graciousness. He was immediately qualifying himself to form an opinion, by giving her very proper attention, after the introduction had passed. In a few minutes the carriage returned. Somebody talked of rain. "'I will see that there are umbrellas, sir,' said Frank to his father. "'Miss Bates must not be forgotten.' And away he went." Mr. Weston was following, but Mrs. Elton detained him, to gratify him by her opinion of his son, and so briskly did she begin, that the young man himself, though by no means moving slowly, could hardly be out of hearing. "'A very fine young man indeed, Mr. Weston. You know, I candidly told you I should form my own opinion, and I am happy to say that I am extremely pleased with him. You may believe me. I never compliment. I think him a very handsome young man, and his manners are precisely what I like and approve. So truly the gentleman, without the least conceit or puppyism. You must know I have a vast dislike to puppies, quite a horror of them. They were never tolerated at Maple Grove. Neither Mr. Suckling nor me had ever any patience with them, and we used sometimes to say very cutting things. Selina, who is mild almost to a fault, bore with them much better. While she talked of his son, Mr. Weston's attention was chained, but when she got to Maple Grove he could recollect that there were ladies just arriving to be attended to, and, with happy smiles, must hurry away. Mrs. Elton turned to Mrs. Weston. "'I have no doubt of its being our carriage with Miss Bates and Jane. Our coachman and horses are so extremely expeditious. I believe we drive faster than anybody. What a pleasure it is to send one's carriage for a friend. I understand you were so kind as to offer, but another time it will be quite unnecessary. You may be sure that I shall always take care of them.' Miss Bates and Miss Fairfax, escorted by the two gentlemen, walked into the room, and Mrs. Elton seemed to think it as much her duty as Mrs. Weston's to receive them. Her gestures and movements might be understood by any one who looked on like Emma, but her words, everybody's words, were soon lost under the incessant flow of Miss Bates, who came in talking, and had not finished her speech under many minutes after her being admitted into the circle at the fire. As the door opened she was heard— "'So very obliging of you. No rain at all. Nothing to signify. I do not care for myself. Quite thick shoes. And Jane declares—' 
Well, as soon as she was within the door, well, this is brilliant, indeed, this is admirable, excellently contrived upon my word, nothing wanted, could not have imagined it, so well lighted up. Jane, Jane, look, did you ever see anything? Oh, Mr. Weston, you must really have had Aladdin's lamp. Good Mrs. Stokes would not know her own room again. I saw her as I came in. She was standing in the entrance. Oh, Mrs. Stokes, said I, but I had not time for more. She was now met by Mrs. Weston. Very well, thank you, ma'am. I hope you are quite well. Very happy to hear it. So afraid you might have a headache, seeing you pass by so often, and knowing how much trouble you must have. Delighted to hear it, indeed. Ah, dear Mrs. Elton, so obliged to you for the carriage. Excellent time. Jane and I quite ready. Did not keep the horses a moment. Most comfortable carriage. Oh, and I am sure our thanks are due to you. Mrs. Weston, on that score— Mrs. Elton had most kindly sent Jane a note, or we should have been—but two such offers in one day. Never were any such neighbours. I said to my mother, Upon my word, ma'am, thank you, my mother is remarkably well, gone to Mr. Woodhouse's. I made her take her shawl, for the evenings are not warm, her large new shawl, Mrs. Dixon's wedding present. So kind of her to think of my mother. Bought at Weymouth, you know, Mr. Dixon's choice. There were three others, Jane says, which they hesitated about some time. Colonel Campbell rather preferred an olive. My dear Jane, are you sure you did not wet your feet? It was but a drop or two, but I am so afraid— But Mr. Frank Churchill was so extremely— And there was a mat to step out upon. I shall never forget his extreme politeness. Oh, Mr. Frank Churchill, I must tell you my mother's spectacles have never been in fault since. The rivet never came out again. My mother often talks of your good nature. Does she not, Jane? Do we not often talk of Mr. Frank Churchill? Ah, here's Miss Woodhouse. Dear Miss Woodhouse, how do you do? "'Very well, thank you. Quite well. This is meeting quite in fairyland. Such a transformation. Must not compliment, I know, eyeing Emma most complacently. That would be rude. But upon my word, Miss Woodhouse, do you look—how do you like Jane's hair? You are a judge. She did it all herself. Quite wonderful how she does her hair. No hairdresser from London, I think, could—ah, Dr. Hughes, I declare, and Mrs. Hughes. Must go and speak to Dr. and Mrs. Hughes for a moment. How do you do? How do you do? Very well, I thank you.' "'This is delightful, is it not? Where is dear Mr. Richard? Oh, there he is. Don't disturb him. Much better employed talking to the young ladies. How do you do, Mr. Richard? I saw you the other day as you rode through the town. Mrs. Otway, I protest, and good Mr. Otway, and Miss Otway, and Miss Carolyn. Such a host of friends, and Mr. George, and Mr. Arthur. How do you do? How do you all do? Quite well. I am much obliged to you. Never better. Don't I hear another carriage? Who can this be? Very likely the worthy Coles. Upon my word, this is charming to be standing about amongst such friends, and such a noble fire. I'm quite roasted. No coffee, thank you, for me. I never take coffee. A little tea, if you please, sir, by and by. No hurry. Oh, here it comes. Everything's so good. Frank Churchill returned to his station by Emma, and as soon as Miss Bates was quiet, she found herself necessarily overhearing the discourse of Mrs. Elton and Miss Fairfax, who were standing a little way behind her. He was thoughtful. Whether he were overhearing, too, she could not determine. After a good many compliments to Jane on her dress and look, compliments very quietly and properly taken, Mrs. Elton was evidently wanting to be complimented herself, and it was, "'How do you like my gown? How do you like my trimming? How has Wright done my hair?' with many other relative questions, all answered with patient politeness. Mrs. Elton then said, "'Nobody can think less of dress in general than I do, but upon such an occasion as this, when everybody's eyes are so much upon me, and in compliment to the Westons, who I have no doubt are giving this ball chiefly to do me honour, I would not wish to be inferior to others. And I see very few pearls in the room except mine. So Frank Churchill is a capital dancer, I understand. We shall see if our styles suit. A fine young man certainly is Frank Churchill. I like him very well.' At this moment Frank began talking so vigorously that Emma could not but imagine he had overheard his own praises, and did not want to hear more, and the voices of the ladies were drowned for a while, till another suspension brought Mrs. Elton's tones again distinctly forward. Mr. Elton had just then joined them, and his wife was exclaiming, "'Oh, you have found us out at last, have you, in our seclusion? I was this moment telling Jane, I thought you would begin to be impatient for tidings of us.' "'Jane,' repeated Frank Churchill, with a look of surprise and displeasure, "'that is easy, but Miss Fairfax does not approve it, I suppose.' "'How do you like Mrs. Elton?' said Emma, in a whisper. "'Not at all. You are ungrateful.' "'Ungrateful? What do you mean?' Then, changing from a frown to a smile, "'No, do not tell me. I do not want to know what you mean. Where is my father? When are we to begin dancing?' Emma could hardly understand him. He seemed in an odd humour.' 
He walked off to find his father, but was quickly back again with both Mr. and Mrs. Weston. He had met with them in a little perplexity, which must be laid before Emma. It had just occurred to Mrs. Weston that Mrs. Elton must be asked to begin the ball, that she would expect it, which interfered with all their wishes of giving Emma that distinction. Emma heard the sad truth with fortitude. "'And what are we to do for a proper partner for her?' said Mr. Weston. "'She will think Frank ought to ask her.' Frank turned instantly to Emma, to claim her former promise, and boasted himself an engaged man, which his father looked his most perfect approbation of, and then it appeared that Mrs. Weston was wanting him to dance with Mrs. Elton himself, and that their business was to help to persuade him into it, which was done pretty soon. Mr. Weston and Mrs. Elton led the way, Mr. Frank Churchill and Miss Woodhouse followed. Emma must submit to stand second to Mrs. Elton, though she had always considered the ball as peculiarly for her. It was almost enough to make her think of marrying. Mrs. Elton had undoubtedly the advantage at this time in vanity completely gratified, for though she had intended to begin with Frank Churchill, she could not lose by the change. Mr. Weston might be his son's superior. In spite of this little rub, however, Emma was smiling with enjoyment, delighted to see the respectable length of the set as it was forming, and to feel that she had so many hours of unusual festivity before her, she was more disturbed by Mr. Knightley's not dancing than by anything else. There he was, among the standers-by, where he ought not to be. He ought to be dancing, not classing himself with the husbands and fathers and whist-players, who were pretending to feel an interest in the dance till their rubbers were made up. So young as he looked— he could not have appeared to greater advantage, perhaps, anywhere, than where he had placed himself. His tall, firm, upright figure, among the bulky forms and stooping shoulders of the elderly men, was such as Emma felt must draw everybody's eyes, and, excepting her own partner, there was not one among the whole row of young men who could be compared with him. He moved a few steps nearer, and those few steps were enough to prove, in how gentlemanlike a manner, with what natural grace, he must have danced, would he but take the trouble." Whenever she caught his eye, she forced him to smile, but in general he was looking grave. She wished he could love a ballroom better, and could like Frank Churchill better. He seemed often observing her. She must not flatter herself that he thought of her dancing, but if he were criticizing her behavior, she did not feel afraid. There was nothing like flirtation between her and her partner. They seemed more like cheerful, easy friends than lovers. That Frank Churchill thought less of her than he had done was indubitable. The ball proceeded pleasantly. The anxious cares, the incessant attentions of Mrs. Weston, were not thrown away. Everybody seemed happy, and the praise of being a delightful ball, which is seldom bestowed till after a ball has ceased to be, was repeatedly given in the very beginning of the existence of this. Of very important, very recordable events, it was not more productive than such meetings usually are. There was one, however, which Emma thought something of. The two last dances before supper were begun, and Harriet had no partner. The only young lady sitting down, and so equal had been hitherto the number of dancers, that how there could be any one disengaged was the wonder. But Emma's wonder lessened soon afterwards, on seeing Mr. Elton sauntering about. He would not ask Harriet to dance if it were possible to be avoided. She was sure he would not, and she was expecting him every moment to escape into the card-room. Escape, however, was not his plan. He came to the part of the room where the sitters-by were collected, spoke to some, and walked about in front of them, as if to show his liberty and his resolution of maintaining it. He did not omit being sometimes directly before Miss Smith, or speaking to those who were close to her. Emma saw it. She was not yet dancing, she was working her way up from the bottom, and had therefore leisure to look around, and by only turning her head a little she saw it all. When she was half-way up the set, the whole group were exactly behind her, and she would no longer allow her eyes to watch, but Mr. Elton was so near that she heard every syllable of a dialogue which just then took place between him and Mrs. Weston, and she perceived that his wife, who was standing immediately above her, was not only listening also, but even encouraging him by significant glances. The kind-hearted, gentle Mrs. Weston had left her seat to join him and say, "'Do not you dance, Mr. Elton?' to which his prompt reply was, most readily, Mrs. Weston, if you will dance with me. Me? Oh, no! I would get you a better partner than myself. I am no dancer. If Mrs. Gilbert wishes to dance, said he, I shall have great pleasure, I am sure, for though beginning to feel myself rather an old married man, and that my dancing days are over, it would give me very great pleasure at any time to stand up with an old friend like Mrs. Gilbert.' 
Mrs. Gilbert does not mean to dance, but there is a young lady disengaged, whom I should be very glad to see dancing. Miss Smith. Miss Smith? Oh, I had not observed. You are extremely obliging. And if I were not an old married man. But my dancing days are over, Mrs. Weston. You will excuse me. Anything else I should be most happy to do at your command, but my dancing days are over. Mrs. Weston said no more, and Emma could imagine with what surprise and mortification she must be returning to her seat. This was Mr. Elton, the amiable, obliging, gentle Mr. Elton. She looked round for a moment. He had joined Mr. Knightley at a little distance, and was arranging himself for settled conversation, while smiles of high glee passed between him and his wife. She would not look again. Her heart was in a glow, and she feared her face might be as hot. In another moment a happier sight caught her, Mr. Knightley leading Harriet to the set. Never had she been more surprised, seldom more delighted than at that instant. She was all pleasure and gratitude for both Harriet and herself, and longed to be thanking him, and though too distant for speech, her countenance said much, as soon as she could catch his eye again. His dancing proved to be just what she had believed it, extremely good, and Harriet would have seemed almost too lucky, if it had not been for the cruel state of things before, and for the very complete enjoyment and very high sense of the distinction which her happy features announced. It was not thrown away on her, she bounded higher than ever, flew farther down the middle, and was in a continual course of smiles. Mr. Elton had retreated into the card-room, looking, Emma trusted, very foolish. She did not think he was quite so hardened as his wife, though growing very like her. She spoke some of her feelings by observing audibly to her partner, "'Nightly has taken pity on poor little Miss Smith. Very good-natured, I declare.' Supper was announced, the move began, and Miss Bates might be heard from that moment without interruption till her being seated at table and taking up her spoon. "'Jane, Jane, my dear Jane, where are you? Here is your tippet. Mrs. Weston begs you to put on your tippet. She says she is afraid there will be draughts in the passage, though everything has been done, one door nailed up, quantities of matting. My dear Jane, indeed you must. Mr. Churchill, oh, you are too obliging. How well you put it on. So gratified. Excellent dancing, indeed.' "'Yes, my dear, I ran home, as I said I should, to help Grandmamma to bed, and got back again, and nobody missed me. I set off without saying a word, just as I told you. Grandmamma was quite well, had a charming evening with Mr. Woodhouse, a vast deal of chat and backgammon. Tea was made downstairs, biscuits and baked apples and wine before she came away, amazing luck in some of her throws, and she inquired a great deal about you, how you were amused, and who were your partners.' "'Oh,' said I, "'I shall not forestall Jane. I left her dancing with Mr. George Otway. She will love to tell you all about it herself to-morrow. Her first partner was Mr. Elton. I do not know who will ask her next. Perhaps Mr. William Cox. "'My dear sir, you are too obliging. Is there nobody you would not rather? I am not helpless. Sir, you are most kind. Upon my word. Jane on one arm, and me on the other. Stop, stop. Let's stand a little back. Mrs. Elton is going. Dear Mrs. Elton, how elegant she looks. Beautiful lace. Now we all follow in her train.' quite the queen of the evening. Well, here we are at the passage. Two steps, Jane. Take care of the two steps. Oh, no, there is but one. Well, I was persuaded there were two. How very odd! I was convinced there were two, and there is but one. I never saw anything equal to the comfort and style. Candles everywhere. I was telling you of your grandmamma, Jane. There was a little disappointment. The baked apples and biscuits, excellent in their way, you know, but there was a delicate fricassee of sweetbread and some asparagus brought in at first, and good Mr. Woodhouse, not thinking the asparagus quite boiled enough, sent it all out again. Now there is nothing Grandmamma loves better than sweetbread and asparagus, so she was rather disappointed, but we agreed we would not speak of it to anybody, for fear of its getting round to dear Miss Woodhouse, who would be so very much concerned. Well, this is brilliant. I am all amazement. Could not have supposed anything— such elegance and profusion i've seen nothing like it since well where shall we sit where shall we sit anywhere so that jane is not in a draught where i sit is of no consequence oh do you recommend this side well i am sure mr churchill only it seems too good but just as you please what you direct in this house cannot be wrong dear jane how shall we ever recollect half the dishes for grandmamma soup too bless me i should not be helped so soon but it smells most excellent and i cannot help beginning Emma had no opportunity of speaking to Mr. Knightley till after supper, but when they were all in the ballroom again, her eyes invited him irresistibly to come to her and be thanked. He was warm in his reprobation of Mr. Elton's conduct. It had been unpardonable rudeness, and Mrs. Elton's looks also received the due share of censure. "'They aimed at wounding more than Harriet,' said he. "'Emma, why is it that they are your enemies?' 
He looked with smiling penetration, and on receiving no answer, added, "'She ought not be angry with you, I suspect, whatever he may be. To that surmise you say nothing, of course, but confess, Emma, that you did want him to marry Harriet.' "'I did,' replied Emma, "'and they cannot forgive me.' He shook his head, but there was a smile of indulgence with it, and he only said, "'I shall not scold you. I leave you to your own reflections.' "'Can you trust me with such flatterers? Does my vain spirit ever tell me I am wrong?' "'Not your vain spirit, but your serious spirit. If one leads you wrong, I am sure the other tells you of it. I do own myself to have been completely mistaken in Mr. Elton. There is a littleness about him which you discovered, and which I did not, and I was fully convinced of his being in love with Harriet. It was through a series of strange blunders. And in return for your acknowledging so much, I will do you the justice to say that you would have chosen for him better than he has chosen for himself.' Harriet Smith has some first-rate qualities, which Mrs. Elton is totally without. An unpretending, single-minded, artless girl, infinitely to be preferred by any man of sense and taste to such a woman as Mrs. Elton. I have found Harriet more conversable than I expected. Emma was extremely gratified. They were both interrupted by the bustle of Mr. Weston, calling on everybody to begin dancing again. "'Come, Miss Woodhouse, Miss Otway, Miss Fairfax, what are you all doing?' "'Come, Emma, set your companions the example. Everybody is lazy. Everybody is asleep.' "'I am ready,' said Emma, "'whenever I am wanted.' "'Whom are you going to dance with?' asked Mr. Knightley. She hesitated a moment, and then replied, "'With you, if you will ask me.' "'Will you?' said he, offering his hand. "'Indeed I will. You have shown that you can dance, and you know we are not really so much brother and sister as to make it at all improper.' "'Brother and sister? No, indeed.' End of Volume 3, Chapter 2, read by Sibella Denton. For more information, please visit LibriVox.org. Volume 3, Chapter 3 of Emma by Jane Austen. Read for LibriVox.org into the public domain. This little explanation with Mr. Knightley gave Emma considerable pleasure. It was one of the agreeable recollections of the ball, which she walked about the lawn the next morning to enjoy. She was extremely glad that they had come to so good an understanding respecting the Eltons, and that their opinions of both husband and wife were so much alike, and his praise of Harriet, his concession in her favour, was peculiarly gratifying. The impertinence of the Eltons, which for a few minutes had threatened to ruin the rest of her evening, had been the occasion of some of its highest satisfactions, and she looked forward to another happy result, the cure of Harriet's infatuation." From Harriet's manner of speaking of the circumstance before they quitted the ballroom, she had strong hopes. It seemed as if her eyes were suddenly opened, and she were enabled to see that Mr. Elton was not the superior creature she had believed him. The fever was over, and Emma could harbour little fear of the pulse being quickened again by injurious courtesy. She depended on the evil feelings of the Eltons for supplying all the discipline of pointed neglect that could be farther requisite. Harriet, rational, Frank Churchill, not too much in love, and Mr. Knightley not wanting to quarrel with her, how very happy a summer must be before her. She was not to see Frank Churchill this morning. He had told her that he could not allow himself the pleasure of stopping at Hartfield, as he was to be at home by the middle of the day. She did not regret it. Having arranged all these matters, looked them through, and put them all to rights, she was just turning to the house with spirits freshened up for the demands of the two little boys, as well as of their grandpapa, when the great iron sweep-gate opened, and two persons entered whom she had never less expected to see together, Frank Churchill, with Harriet leaning on his arm, actually Harriet. A moment sufficed to convince her that something extraordinary had happened. Harriet looked white and frightened, and he was trying to cheer her, the iron gates and the front door were not twenty yards asunder. They were th all three soon in the hall, and Harriet, immediately sinking into a chair, fainted away. A young lady who faints must be recovered. Questions must be answered, and surprises be explained. Such events are very interesting, but the suspense of them cannot last long. A few minutes made Emma acquainted with the whole. Miss Smith and Miss Bickerton, another parlour boarder at Mrs. Goddard's, who had been also at the ball, had walked out together and taken a road, the Richmond Road, which, though apparently public enough for safety, had led them into alarm. About half a mile beyond Highbury, making a sudden turn, and deeply shaded by elms on each side, it became for a considerable stretch very retired, and when the young ladies had advanced some way into it, they had suddenly perceived at a small distance before them, 
on a broader patch of greensward by the side, a party of gypsies. A child on the watch came towards them to beg, and Miss Bickerton, excessively frightened, gave a great scream, and calling on Harriet to follow her, ran up a steep bank, cleared a slight hedge at the top, and made the best of her way, by a short cut, back to Highbury. But poor Harriet could not follow. She had suffered very much from cramp after dancing, and her first attempt to mount the bank brought on such a return of it as made her absolutely powerless, and in this state, and exceedingly terrified, she had been obliged to remain. How the trampers might have behaved, had the young ladies been more courageous, must be doubtful, but such an invitation for attack could not be resisted, and Harriet was soon assailed by half a dozen children, headed by a stout woman and a great boy, all clamorous and impertinent in look, though not absolutely in word. More and more frightened, she immediately promised them money, and taking out her purse, gave them a shilling, and begged them not to want more, or to use her ill. She was then able to walk, though but slowly, and was moving away, but her terror and her purse were too tempting, and she was followed, or rather surrounded, by the whole gang, demanding more. In this state Frank Churchill had found her, she trembling and conditioning, they loud and insolent. By a most fortunate chance his leaving Highbury had been delayed so as to bring him to her assistance at this critical moment. The pleasantness of the morning had induced him to walk forward, and leave his horses to meet him by another road a mile or two beyond Highbury, and, happening to have borrowed a pair of scissors the night before of Miss Bates, and to have forgotten to restore them, he had been obliged to stop at her door, and go in for a few minutes. He was therefore later than he had intended, and, being on foot, was unseen by the whole party till almost close to them. The terror which the woman and boy had been creating in Harriet was then their own portion. He had left them completely frightened, and Harriet, eagerly clinging to him, and hardly able to speak, had just strength enough to reach Hartfield, before her spirits were quite overcome. It was his idea to bring her to Hartfield. He had thought of no other place. This was the account of the whole story, of his communication and of Harriet's as soon as she had recovered her senses and speech. He dared not stay longer than to see her well. These several delays left him not another minute to lose, and Emma engaging to have assurance of her safety to Mrs. Goddard, and notice of there being such a set of people in the neighbourhood to Mr. Knightley, he set off, with all the grateful blessings that she could utter for her friend and herself. Such an adventure as this, a fine young man and a lovely young woman thrown together in such a way, could hardly fail of suggesting certain ideas to the coldest heart and the steadiest brain. So Emma thought, at least. Could a linguist, could a grammarian, could even a mathematician have seen what she did, have witnessed their appearance together, and heard their history of it, without feeling that circumstances had been at work to make them peculiarly interesting to each other? How much more must an imaginist, like herself, be on fire with speculation and foresight, especially with such a groundwork of anticipation as her mind had already made? It was a very extraordinary thing. Nothing of the sort had ever occurred before to any young ladies in the place, within her memory, no rencontre, no alarm of the kind, and now it had happened to the very person, and at the very hour, when the other very person was chancing to pass by to rescue her. It certainly was very extraordinary. And knowing, as she did, the favourable state of mind of each at this period, it struck her the more. He was wishing to get the better of his attachment to herself, she just recovering from her mania for Mr. Elton. It seemed as if everything united to promise the most interesting consequences. It was not possible that the occurrence should not be strongly recommending each to the other. In the few minutes' conversation which she had yet had with him, while Harriet had been partially insensible, he had spoken of her terror, her naivete, her fervour as she seized and clung to his arm, with a sensibility amused and delighted, and just at last, after Harriet's own account had been given, he had expressed his indignation at the abominable folly of Miss Bickerton in the warmest terms. Everything was to take its natural course, however, neither impelled nor assisted. She would not stir a step, nor drop a hint. No, she had had enough of interference. There could be no harm in a scheme, a mere passive scheme. It was no more than a wish. Beyond it she would on no account proceed. Emma's first resolution was to keep her father from the knowledge of what had passed, aware of the anxiety and alarm it would occasion, but she soon felt that concealment must be impossible. Within half an hour it was known all over Highbury. It was the very event to engage those who talked most, the young and the low, and all the youth and servants in the place were soon in the happiness of frightful news. The last night's ball seemed lost in the gypsies. 
poor Mr. Woodhouse trembled as he sat, and, as Emma had foreseen, would scarcely be satisfied without their promising never to go beyond the shrubbery again. It was some comfort to him that many inquiries after himself and Miss Woodhouse, for his neighbours knew that he loved to be inquired after, as well as Miss Smith, were coming in during the rest of the day, and he had the pleasure of returning for answer, that they were all very indifferent, which, though not exactly true, for she was perfectly well, and Harriet not much otherwise, Emma would not interfere with. She had an unhappy state of health in general for the child of such a man, for she hardly knew what indisposition was, and if he did not invent illnesses for her, she could make no figure in a message. The gypsies did not wait for the operations of justice. They took themselves off in a hurry. The young ladies of Highbury might have walked again in safety before their panic began, and the whole history dwindled soon into a matter of little importance but to Emma and her nephews. In her imagination it maintained its ground, and Henry and John were still asking every day for the story of Harriet and the gypsies, and still tenaciously setting her right if she varied in the slightest particular from the original recital. End of Volume 3, Chapter 3 Read by Sibella Denton for more information, please visit LibriVox.org. Volume 3, Chapter 4 of Emma by Jane Austen. Read for LibriVox.org into the public domain. A very few days had passed after this adventure, when Harriet came one morning to Emma with a small parcel in her hand, and after sitting down and hesitating, thus began— "'Miss Woodhouse, if you are at leisure, I have something that I should like to tell you, a sort of confession to make, and then you know it will be over.' Emma was a good deal surprised, but begged her to speak. There was a seriousness in Harriet's manner which prepared her, quite as much as her words, for something more than ordinary. "'It is my duty, and I am sure it is my wish,' she continued, "'to have no reserves with you on this subject. As I am happily quite an altered creature in one respect, it is very fit that you should have the satisfaction of knowing it. I do not want to say more than is necessary. I am too much ashamed of having given way as I have done, and I dare say you understand me. Yes, said Emma, I hope I do. How I could so long a time be fancying myself, cried Harriet warmly. It seems like madness. I can see nothing at all extraordinary in him now. I do not care whether I meet him or not, except that of the two I had rather not see him, and indeed I would go any distance round to avoid him. But I do not envy his wife in the least, neither admire nor envy her as I have done. She is very charming, I dare say, and all that, but I think her very ill-tempered and disagreeable. I shall never forget her look the other night. However, I assure you, Miss Woodhouse, I wish her no evil. No, let them be ever so happy together. It will not give me another moment's pang, and to convince you that I have been speaking the truth, I am now going to destroy what I ought to have destroyed long ago, what I ought never to have kept. I know that very well, blushing as she spoke. However, now I will destroy it, and it is my particular wish to do it in your presence, that you may see how rational I am grown. Cannot you guess what this parcel holds? said she, with a conscious look. Not the least in the world. Did he ever give you anything? No, I cannot call them gifts, but they are things that I have valued very much. She held the parcel towards her, and Emma read the words, Most Precious Treasures, on top. Her curiosity was greatly excited. Harriet unfolded the parcel, and she looked on with impatience. Within abundance of silver paper was a pretty little Tunbridge ware box, which Harriet opened. It was well lined with the softest cotton, but excepting the cotton, Emma saw only a small piece of court plaster. Now, said Harriet, you must recollect. No, indeed, I do not. Dear me, I should not have thought it possible that you could forget what passed in this very room about court plaster, one of the very last times we ever met in it. It was but a very few days before I had my sore throat, just before Mr. and Mrs. John Knightley came, I think the very evening. Do you not remember his cutting his finger with your new penknife, and your recommending court plaster? But as you had none about you, and knew I had, you desired me to supply him, and so I took mine out and cut him a piece. But it was a great deal too large, and he cut it smaller, and kept playing some time with what was left, before he gave it back to me. And so then, in my nonsense, I could not help making a treasure of it. So I put it by, never to be used, and looked at it now and then as a great treat. "'My dearest Harriet,' cried Emma, putting her hand before her face, and jumping up, "'you make me more ashamed of myself than I can bear. 
"'Remember it? Ay, I remember it all now. Except your saving this relic, I knew nothing of that till this moment. But the cutting the finger, and my recommending court-plaster, and saying I had none about me. Oh, my sins, my sins! And I had plenty all the while in my pocket. One of my senseless tricks. I deserved to be under a continual blush all the rest of my life. Well, sitting down again, go on, what else? And you had really some at hand yourself.' I am sure I never suspected it. You did it so naturally. And so you actually put this piece of court plaster by for his sake, said Emma, recovering from her state of shame, and feeling divided between wonder and amusement. And secretly she added to herself, Lord bless me, when should I ever have thought of putting by in cotton a piece of court plaster that Frank Churchill had been pulling about? I never was equal to this. Here, resumed Harriet, turning her box again, here is something still more valuable, I mean, that has been more valuable, because this is what really did once belong to him, which the court-plaster never did. Emma was quite eager to see this superior treasure. It was the end of an old pencil, the part without any lead. This was really his, said Harriet. Do you not remember one morning? No, I dare say you do not. But one morning, I forget exactly the day, but perhaps it was the Tuesday or Wednesday before that evening, he wanted to make a memorandum in his pocket-book. It was about spruce beer. Mr. Knightley had been telling him something about brewing spruce beer, and he wanted to put it down. But when he took out his pencil, there was so little lead that he soon cut it all away, and it would not do. So you lent him another, and this was left upon the table as good for nothing. But I kept my eye on it, and as soon as I dared, caught it up, and never parted with it again from that moment. "'I do remember it,' cried Emma. "'I perfectly remember it. Talking about spruce beer. Oh, yes, Mr. Knightley and I both saying that we liked it, and Mr. Elton seeming resolved to learn to like it, too. I perfectly remember it. Stop. Mr. Knightley was standing just here, was he not? I have an idea he was standing just here. Ah, I do not know. I cannot recollect. It is very odd, but I cannot recollect. Mr. Elton was sitting here, I remember, much about where I am now. Well, go on. Oh, that's all. I have nothing more to show you, or to say, except that I am now going to throw them both behind the fire, and I wish you to see me do it. My poor dear Harriet, and have you actually found happiness in treasuring up these things? Yes, simpleton that I was, but I am quite ashamed of it now, and wish I could forget as easily as I can burn them. It was very wrong of me, you know, to keep any remembrances after he was married. I knew it was, but I had not resolution enough to part with them. "'But, Harriet, is it necessary to burn the court-plaster? I have not a word to say for the bit of old pencil, but the court-plaster might be useful.' "'I shall be happier to burn it,' replied Harriet. "'It has a disagreeable look to me. I must get rid of everything. There it goes, and there is an end, thank heaven, of Mr. Elton.' "'And when,' thought Emma, "'will there be a beginning of Mr. Churchill?' She had soon afterwards reason to believe that the beginning was already made, and could not but hope that the gypsy, though she had told no fortune, might be proved to have made Harriet's. About a fortnight after the alarm, they came to a sufficient explanation, and quite undesignedly. Emma was not thinking of it at the moment, which made the information she received more valuable. She merely said, in the course of some trivial chat, "'Well, Harriet, whenever you marry I would advise you to do so-and-so,' and thought no more of it, till after a minute's silence she heard Harriet say, in a very serious tone, "'I shall never marry.' Emma then looked up and immediately saw how it was, and after a moment's debate, as to whether it should pass unnoticed or not, replied, "'Never marry! This is a new resolution. It is one that I shall never change, however.' After another short hesitation, "'I hope it does not proceed from—I hope it is not in compliment to Mr. Elton.' "'Mr. Elton, indeed!' cried Harriet indignantly. "'Oh, no!' And Emma could just catch the words, "'So superior to Mr. Elton!' She then took a longer time for consideration. Should she proceed no farther? Should she let it pass, and seem to suspect nothing? Perhaps Harriet might think her cold or angry if she did, or perhaps, if she were totally silent, it might only drive Harriet into asking her to hear too much.' and against anything like such an unreserve as had been, such an open and frequent discussion of hopes and chances, she was perfectly resolved. She believed it would be wiser for her to say and know at once, all that she meant to say and know. Plain dealing was always best. She had previously determined how far she would proceed, on any application of the sort, and it would be safer for both to have the judicious law of her own brain laid down with speed, 
she was decided, and thus spoke, "'Harriet, I will not affect to be in doubt of your meaning. Your resolution, or rather your expectation of never marrying, results from an idea that the person whom you might prefer would be too greatly your superior in situation to think of you. Is it not so?' "'Oh, Miss Woodhouse, believe me, I have not the presumption to suppose—indeed, I am not so mad, but it is a pleasure to me to admire him at a distance, and to think of his infinite superiority to all the rest of the world, with the gratitude, wonder, and veneration, which are so proper, in me especially.' "'I am not surprised at you, Harriet. The service he rendered you was enough to warm your heart. Service! Oh, it was such an inexpressible obligation! The very recollection of it, and all that I felt at the time, when I saw him coming, his noble look, and my wretchedness before. Such a change! In one moment such a change! From perfect misery to perfect happiness! It is very natural. It is natural, and it is honourable. Yes, honourable, I think, to choose so well and so gratefully. But that it will be a fortunate preference is more than I can promise. I do not advise you to give way to it, Harriet. I do not by any means engage for its being returned. Consider what you are about. Perhaps it will be wisest in you to check your feelings while you can, or at any rate do not let them carry you far, unless you are persuaded of his liking you. Be observant of him. Let his behaviour be the guide of your sensations. I give you this caution now, because I shall never speak to you again on the subject. I am determined against all interference. Henceforward I know nothing of the matter. Let no name ever pass our lips. We were very wrong before. We will be cautious now. He is your superior, no doubt, and there do seem objections and obstacles of a very serious nature. But yet, Harriet, more wonderful things have taken place. There have been matches of greater disparity. But take care of yourself. I would not have you too sanguine, though, however it may end, be assured your raising your thoughts to him is a mark of good taste, which I shall always know how to value. Harriet kissed her hand in silent and submissive gratitude. Emma was very decided in thinking such an attachment no bad thing for her friend. Its tendency would be to raise and refine her mind, and it must be saving her from the danger of degradation. End of Volume 3, Chapter 4 Read by Sibella Denton For more information, please visit LibriVox.org